everyone, and uh, well, thanks very much for being here, uh, speakers, non speakers. Um, well, this is an exciting day um, for Tom and I. We've been co organizing this for a while. The original idea for this symposium was actually a, a journal issue that we're co editing, Tom and I, with um, a few of the, of the papers that you're going to be seeing that you're going to be listening to today. Um, the idea came from the realization that there's uh, research going on on some studies in different cultures, and uh, there's been a, a big search for these, as you can probably tell from the number of conferences being advertised in some studies. But nothing uh, has been produced, uh, no, no book or journal issue has been focused on some cultures of Spain to realize. And we thought we had to put some revenue to this, and this is why we're here today. Uh, the project started with, uh, with uh, work on Spain, but then uh, we decided that we wanted to broaden the scope of that and incorporate uh, contributions uh, in what is, uh, some cultures, which unfortunately cannot be part of the, of the journal issue because that's published by the Journal of Spanish Cultural Studies, so unfortunately it can't go back. So that's, that's the reason we are um, us wanting to, to include it. This session starts with uh, Jacques Silva, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. Uh, so he's in Skype. Uh, I need to maximize the screen. Okay. Um, he can see us, but he can hear us, and uh, so we'll be able to make questions after. Um, as a general rule, we're going to have all papers together for every session, and then have the questions at the end, because I think that will allow to allow us to have a more um, cohesive dialogue. Um, so this is. Uh, Please introduce Joao Silva, actually in front of you, uh, from the Universidad de Nova Lisboa, and uh, his paper is titled The Queens Have Started Playing a Noisy Jazz with Sweet Alacrity, Sounds in Lisbon during the First Portuguese Republic. So, Joao, um, can you say a few words to make sure we can hear you? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay. okay. So, when you're ready. Okay, I'll start. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak, and fortunately, I'm not able to be in London, but I'm speaking from Porto. So, and about Lisbon. So, it's the two major competing cities in Portugal. Well, this is the first stage, I would say, of my research because most of my research has been concentrated on uh, late 19th century, first decade of the 20th century Portuguese music, and now I'm working on the following thing. So. The first Portuguese Republic, which lasted from 1910 to 1926. So, after uh, this paper studies the multiple and complete and conflicting layers of sound that were circulating in Lisbon between 1910 and 1926. In the last decades of the 19th century, the city witnessed the growth of the entertainment market and the rise of the boulevard culture of popular entertainment. Operators and musical reviews nominated the city stages. These articulated different forms of sound in an old way, and the incipient recording industry captured the music of the city theater and the sanitized version of old and popular music. The catalogs of the early recording companies included theatrical songs and fathers played by prominent performers, marches and albums played by wind bands. Thus, Local repertoire forms a bulk of these recordings. The ubiquity of the popular theatre was intensified with the establishment of the Portuguese Republic on October 5, 1910. In the first years of the new regime, the popular theatre was an important vehicle for Republican propaganda. Many authors were Republican and equated Republican in this paper. However, the Portuguese Republic was essentially urban with a strong Jacobin tendency. This made its survival in a predominantly rural and Catholic country complicated. Moreover, its supporters were essentially the middle class and a part of the white collar proletariat, such as teachers and shopkeepers. Despite the reliance on anarchist, socialist, and working class people in the October coup, the Republic soon let them down. As early as January 1911, a strike wave shook the country, and the repression that followed showed the with the regime and the workers. 
Later that year, the provisional government passed the law of separation of the state and the church, intensifying Portuguese instability. When the Republic was celebrating its first anniversary, an attempt to reinstate the monarchy was led by five of the We are living interesting times. Since the Republican regime kept catered particularly to the needs of the urban middle classes, it had a deep impact in Lisbon. Lisbon has been the focus of Republican agitation since the monarchy, and the sound of open air rallies and their marching bands echoed across the city's soundscape in the early years of the 20th century. Anthems and marches resonated in the city's streets, in theaters, and at home. The sounds of strikes and protests were heard in Lisbon's main streets, mixed with the cries of the peasant and with the sound of the city that had more and more automobiles. More strong cars coexisted with the new cars available revealing the asymmetries of the modern city. The Portuguese First Republic also saw the establishment of regular symphonic business in Lisbon, in a city in which the elegant society saw and was seen in the boxes of the Italian theater, uh, the Real Piano now now the regular forms of symphonic repertoire contributed to the reshaping of the other sound at the time, the other song cards performed spoken drama and offered the stage in the Coliseo de Jucarez, a more popular band. The concert season of the Teatro Republica, former Don Amelia, started in 1911 under the baton of Pedro Blanc. The Big Sosa conducted an orchestra in the new Teatro Boliviana, established in 1930. Fernandes Schoen substituted Sosa after his untimely death in 1918. The performance of both orchestras introduced Lisbon's audience to the works of composers like Glazunov, Mussorgsky, Borodin, Chabrier, Lalo, DBC, Mendelssohn, Thompson, or even Beethoven. Portugal took part in the First World War, which had a deep impact on the country's economy. Before sending a contingent to the Western Front, Portugal had been reinforcing the military presence in its African colony. The Portuguese Republic began a serious investment in the colony. It was clear that the country's future depended on its colonial possessions because of their resources. Since Angola and Mozambique had borders with German colonies, Portugal sent its troops. The scarceness of resources and the wartime economy was reflected in the rise of the cost of living. This made the situation of men unbearable, especially in urban areas. In a rural country, with an economy based on subsistence agriculture, people in the cities were more vulnerable to poverty. Moreover, the wages did not grow proportionately. However, the high prices of the black market made some people very wealthy. Speculating and hoarding on products of first need was often criticized in the workers' press, which blamed the Republican government for allowing this situation to happen. With the war raging in Central Europe, a large number of European travelers circulated in Lisbon. People demanded entertainment, and the first cosmopolitan clubs were established in Lisbon. They were especially concentrated in Rua Eugenia Castanhos, close to, entertain to the entertainment district, and transformed the sociability routines of the new affluent classes. Some were established in old palaces, while others relied on the new generation of modern starters to do their best for Places such as the Bristol Club, the Gullet Club, Majestic Club, or the Club Mayor, BK, Nightlife, or Spots. Moreover, they embodied modern and cosmopolitan entertainment tendencies. Theatres, circuses, and variety shows were performed to an audience that would be more or less active but did not participate directly in the play. They sang along the chorus or interacted intermittently with the character, but the show was not, was not there. With the new independent models, revelers made their own show. The dance plays of the 10th and 20th introduced new social dances such as the tango, the charleston, the samba, the black box, and the shape. People danced frantically in nightclubs to import the music from the Americas until the day broke. 
jazz bands who are all night long embodying the spirit of the year. Popular music theaters and small orchestras consisting of strings and a few windows. Now saxophones, banjos and drums and drums. Listen to my time. Nevertheless, the repertoire was varied and the performance very significant. Moreover, some accompanied variety and type from the club managers, my club managers, and had to regularly accommodate these new repertoires in the shows. Nightclubs were places of hedonistic pleasures. The gambling rooms were crowded, and drugs such as morphine, cocaine, and ether were widely available to wealthy patrons. Prostitutes, known as papillon, were an assiduous presence in our clubs. Moreover, these sites were such places for engaging in sexual and gender experimentation in a deeply conservative country. Thus, cross-dressing, homosexuality, and polygamy were often part of the accounts of Lisbon's nightlife at the time. Fashion angled modernist decorations, striving to keep up with the cosmopolitan circle. A complex amount of sounds and colors were published, of was part of Lisbon's nightlife. Sounds of the gambling tables, people talking, jasmine, playing, merge in a cacophonous indoor soundscape in which layers could be discerned but not isolated. Protest and violence were also part of the nightclub city. Despite its ubiquity, gambling was not allowed. Thus, the police sometimes placed the clubs, embryonic gambling guys, and then find their own. Moreover, the colonization of whom some areas by the wealthy was not peaceful. Armed groups associated with the revolutionary syndicalist or communist movements such as the Legion of Remain, Red Legion, associated often raided the clubs, stealing both jewelry and money and blackmailing black their friends. The Legion of Remain wanted to enforce proletarian terrorism to counteract what they call bourgeois terrorism. Thus, the prosperity of some was met by the needs of others. The awareness for the colonies grew in the last days of the monarchy. The new regime intensified its tendency. In this period, colonial blacks were seen as a primitive colonial workforce. African music was seldom performed in the metropolis, apart from some imperial celebrations and commodity racism pervaded. However, the interwar period saw the spreading of fashionable African-American jobs in Europe. They were already part of Parisian cosmopolitan modernity and Parisian interwar Negro period, as a contemporary author named the phenomenon, transformed the pop, the Portuguese and the Venice market. American blacks were then associated with both primitivism and sophistication and the rejuvenated group featuring so Josephine Baker and Sidney Schick performed in Wisdom during the military dictatorship. The new songs from across the Atlantic were not exclusive to the excellent classes and were soon integrated into popular theatres. The musical review was a topical show whose success depended on the ability to command on current events. Moreover, it rapidly accommodated new musical genre in its sketches. Thus, uh, genres such as the Charleston were soon performed to a wider audience in the theatre. The popular theatre service was deeply transformed in the 1920s with the creation of the Park Mayor, close to the Avenida de Liberdad. The Park Mayor had several review theatres, the Teatro Maria de Pai, established in 1922, the Teatro Maria Lach, opened in 1926, and the Capitol inaugurated in 1931. Apart from concentrating on review performances, the park mayor had restaurants, spaces where public performed, and all sorts of reviews, and was marketed as a small Portuguese quality. Thus, despite the political instability and economic crisis, a cultural popular recreation thrived through during the Portuguese First Republic. A significant transformation of the Lisbon soundscape was associated with a new form of entertainment, cinema. The first, when real films were shown as part of variety shows and fair round attractions. Thus, venues such as the Real Police of Lisboa and the Winter Garden of the Teatro Donamel showed cinema as a new experimental attraction. 
and a large number of hematographers were established in the second half of the 1970s. This placed them upon small, improvised rooms in Lisbon Tower. Later, different cinemas were established and a network of premier and representatives covered the entire city. Lisbon was in love with the cinema. Moreover, film was a democratic entertainment. Venues opened in the fashionable areas, as well as in working class districts. Long and noisy queues for tickets became part of the city's soundscape. The first decade of the 20th century saw more women joining the workforce. In Portuguese cities, working class women were employed in factories, especially in the canned fish industry. The rise of a new set of professions associated with modern development enlarged the working market for women. New telephone networks required operators, administrative duties, demanded secretaries, and department stores needed shop assistants. This created a group of professional young women with the school of Lincoln who wanted to have a good time. The rise of cinema as of some cinema as some as legitimate entertainment embodied in the new developments where modern sophistication and comfort coexisted helped to reshape the weekly routine of professional young women. Music in Portuguese cinema, cinemas was fair. Smaller rooms accommodated the piano and the pianist, sometimes the play piano, while others kept the string sex steps. In some rare cases, cinemas and spoilers on the forest. Moreover, not every sound in the system of music. Narrators were employed to recount the films with literature. Pictures with the sound effects and actors recreate the dialogue behind the projection screen. Repertoires were heterogeneous. Since many films were important and cinemas showed several unreal processions, the music was frequently adapted. The dealings for the music director were responsible for selecting and arranging adequate repertoire for the films. Thus, musical accompaniment had to keep up with a variety of effects. When the narrative multi-wheel field started to dominate, things changed. A soundtrack by the Portuguese composer Antonio Tomás Lima was added to the film Uzmo, directed by Rodrigo Mundo and premiered in 1923, two years later. In the Lisbon premiere of Fritz Lang's Metropolis in 1930, Peter Blood directed a 50 piece orchestra playing both with Cooper's original score. Thus, playing and producing for film was a complex and varied task. Electricity transformed everyday life in Lisbon. Starting in the 60s, public lighting in the end of the 19th century, it soon extended to the public transport network. Suburban train lines were electrified, and electric trams became a staple of the city. Thus, the sounds of steam were abated, but new sounds were placed. Electrical signs were used to buy theaters and cinemas, and the night in the city never looked the same. Colored billboards advertised all sorts of products. The most important consequences of electrification for music were electric recording, the sound field, and wireless radio. However, only the latter was introduced in Portugal before 1926. Nevertheless, electrical recording and sound films became an important part of Lisbon's everyday life in the 1930s. At first, wireless radio was a communication system. Radio amateurs made their crystal sets, which were used to send and receive messages. The new medium was not intended as a source of entertainment. Nevertheless, this changed the beginning part of the 1920s. The vacuum tube and the tuner mating system. As early as 1924, there was news that public broadcasts in Portugal would be regulated. Periodicals dedicated to the wireless advertised broadcasts from London and Paris. During the peak of the European jazz craze, Portuguese radio enthusiasts were able to listen to the, these repertoires played thousands of miles away. In March 1925, the station CT1AA started its regular transmissions. It was located in the Avenida Antonio Costanha and belonged to a Billy Nunes dos Santos Jr. Nunes dos Santos was related with the owner of the Armadei do Chial, a department store. Thus, between pieces of classical music, it advertised their products, including records. Despite his initial effort, we will have to wait until the 1930s for a national radio broadcasting station to be established. Nevertheless, electricity facilitated domestic life and carried sounds from the ether 
to the people of Lindenburg. The Portuguese First Republic saw the heyday of the mechanical theater. This device was incorporated in an instrument that was already part of many households. Thus, it articulated Victorian values of self accomplishment with a new trend for mechanization. In Portugal, there are no facilities for piano and mechanical piano manufacturing. Thus, the local market was forced to rely on importers. Piano rolls were sold in music stores that also traded in musical instruments. Brands such as Union and Uppfeld uh, became also goods, and player pianos were also used in theaters and in cinemas. Their repertoire consisted of classical pieces and popular songs and dances, reflecting the growing importance of American music genre in the local and domestic market. The price of these values were persistent sound and instant sound scale. These varied from pedal to pedal and with the advertised stock. They were seasonal and were uh, as auditory synchronizers of everyday life. Toward the end of the 19th century, the sound of barrel organs was a frequent presence in the city. Popular films from operas, operettas, and reviews circulated in the streets. However, they disappeared in 1910. The sounds of church bells playing popular tunes several times a day were a ubiquitous spread. The law of separation of the state and search church aimed to restrict the use of church bells. Now the tolls and fields were under the direct ju jurisdiction of council authorities. Since bells served multi multiple purposes, the authorities limited the religious religious tolls to daytime. Nevertheless, there are records of several violations. Therefore, some parishes resisted the Jacobin effort to clear the auditory public space from the sound of the Catholic devotion. Fado is an urban popular song that developed in Lisbon in the 19th century. It was a song performed in sordid taverns of the cities of the districts by social outcasts. However, it was incorporated in salon sociability in the late 19th century. Moreover, it developed a political repertoire. Thus, Republican, anarchist, socialist, and communist singers and poets spread their message through music. The singer's home black was linked with revolutionary syndicalism, and Carlos Rath, the, uh, Carlos Rath, the first secretary general of the newly founded Portuguese Communist Party, established in 1921, sang Father Two. Thus, the genre accompanied the social transformation of the time. Moreover, since surveillance of the workers' movement increased and several personalities condemned Pablo, the music underwent a process of sanitation. On the one hand, worker poets and singers like Evelyn Souza promoted the genre as a moral compass of the art world of people. Conversely, several cafes, beer houses, and restaurants began to show Pablo, contributing to its respectability. Cover charges and stricter admission policies aimed to transform the surroundings of Pablo performance. The dark alleys and the taverns were still there, but there was a process to professionalize and to legitimate the activity. This was intensified by the military dictatorship and by the Stato, which regulated spaces and repertoires through licensing and censorship. This can also be linked with the rise of tourism and of the demand for physical yet respectable forms of entertainment. This paper has shown the transformations of everyday life in and its implications for South, in Lisbon and its implications for South. Lisbon was a contested ground between the traditional and the modern. Old Lisbon carved its imprint deep in the people's routines, like the style of the photograph. Its sound resonated and surfaced the bit the quest for modernization. The boulevard culture of the late 19th century was transformed by the new import of genres from the Americas. Popular theaters were established in a more articulated system. Modern nightclubs were established to cater for a cosmopolitan, sophisticated audience. People wanted to dance, gamble, and have careless fun and spend money. Silent film became ubiquitous in Lisbon big strips, and its wide audience was exposed to its sound. Recorded music was already part of everyday life, and wireless studios and play piano made their way into the earth to live in the world. Music was getting. Yes? Uh, could you. Um, would it be possible to conclude in two minutes or so? Yes, I'm in the last two minutes. Yeah. Music was getting more and more ubiquitous, 
sound of the ocean it is appearing such as the barrel organ, but the sound emerged during the sonic barrel. In a tense period of Portuguese history, the domesticating sound was part and parcel of Portuguese modernity. Church bells were regulated to show the separation of church and state, and also became part of the force the shifting of entertainment service. Thus, both sonic space was a contested area in urban development, embodying different and contradictory tenets. The tenets of regulation was intensified with military purpose, May 20th, 1926. It established a military dictatorship with the support of the constitutive sector of the Portuguese society, reverting many policies of the Portuguese First Republic. The authorities regulated the cabinet and entertained the banks as a form of social control. Nevertheless, new sounds kept missing, fixing with the old city, as music from the Americas was translated by local musicians in the capital of the Soviet Empire. Thank you. Thank you, John. So, our next speaker is Richard Elliott from Newcastle University, and the title of his paper is, I hope to pronounce it well, Latino as Urban Sound Encounter. Thank you. Uh, morning, everyone, um, and uh, thanks for having me here. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about is kind of, um, it's also sort of based um, in Lisbon, but about 100 years later from uh, the, the time that um, the trial. Was, was talking about, at least the, the first part of this paper. <clears throat> so uh, this paper brings together several strands of my past, present and hopefully future research, um, most notably the music of uh, Portugal and specifically Lisbon. Um, urban musicology, uh, broadly understood as the relationship between music and cities. Um, sound studies, particularly those that address the materiality of sound. Uh, and global pop music, which I distinguish in various ways from what is often called world music. As such, the paper, like music itself, stages an interdisciplinary encounter. That word encounter features in my title and underlies pretty much all of what I'm going to say today. I'll start by staging an encounter with some music that has been shaping the electronic dance music scene in Lisbon in recent years and which has had considerable popularity outside of Portugal too. So I'll play two short clips. Um, the first by DJ Marfox and the second by uh, DJ Hecox. Um, and I've also got some quotes here which I'm not going to read out, but these are just to kind of flag some of the tropes of particularly strangeness and futurity that uh, frequently shape the writing about this music, so in music journalism, etc. Uh, so <laughs> In, in this uh, music journalism is underlined by the records on which it appears, uh, especially those from the Lisbon-based Prinsipa records, uh, who are very much leading the local and international promotion of Latina. These are some of the record covers in which this music is uh, released under. Uh, the records come with labels and sleeves that contain little or no contextual information, but share a common visual aesthetic. Um, just to say, oh, these are some of the musicians as well. So um, some of the DJ Marfox, uh, whose music I was just playing there. Um, these are the team of four uh, Portuguese uh, music industry people who have set up Principle um, Records and are releasing a lot of this music. So part of what I'm talking about is also kind of the encounter between this group of people and this group of people, which I'll come back to later. Um, some of the other, um, I'm also including in my research uh, music from groups such as Baraka Sons Sistema, 
um, who started releasing music in 2006, um, helped popularise popularized the Kuduro music being made in Lisbon. Um, also the DJ uh, Pedro Cocanhau, who um, confusingly for this paper performs under the pseudonym Batida. Um, and uh, just to say a little bit more um, about what this Batida is that my title refers to, it's not that DJ specifically, but rather a term that's been used uh, to describe a form of electronic dance music associated with the Afro-diasporic DJs of Lisbon, first or second generation immigrants from Portugal's former colonies, especially Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Cabo Verde, Sao Tome, and Príncipe. And it's influenced and seen as an evolution of um, the EDM, that's electronic dance music, musics that have come from these countries, especially the Guduro and Tadashina music of Angola. Like Kuduro, this is music that, while it may occasionally make reference to older styles, is contemporary music created entirely using digital audio workstations, such as FL Studio. The strangeness and futurity have been themes associated with the sound of Batida, as evidenced by the way it's been written about. How do we start to translate it into some form of familiarity? Do we even want to? I think we do, I do. Um, and one obvious answer lies in what the music is most obviously made for. So to take another Paul quote, this time from The Guardian, although it might sound alien at first, this is party music. After the, um, after the sense of disorientation subsides, your feet take over. But for many listeners, uh, curiosity remains after the body has grown tired, or feet have lost their rhythm, or there's no one around to dance with. Another way to get a handle on the sound then is through the information that comes with the releases. So although I said not much comes with the, the records themselves, there's a whole kind of online commentary that goes along with the, this music when it's released. So the Principa team in particular have proven themselves adept at providing compelling backstories and contextual spin. And I use that word in a positive way, uh, both to acknowledge the need for PR, um, but also as a DJ relevant term. There's also been extensive uh, coverage of the Batida scene in online and English language uh, print media, um, <coughs> outlets such as Vice, Thump, um, Fact Magazine, The Wire, Resident Advisor. For a global dance music scene still dominated by Anglo-American understandings of popular music, Batida is often explained as a collective term for Kuduro, Tadashinya, Kizomba, mixed with house and techno, and then often compared to Chicago footwork and British grime. So just as Fado, for example, is often compared to the blues, there always seems to be this need for kind of Anglo translation um, in talking about these musics. Still, there's some justification in this, given that Kuduro developed as an Angolan response to American house music um, back in the 80s and 90s. America is not only or even the dominant player here, however, um, and we should look to parallel scenes such as the dance music cultures of South Africa, Brazil, and Uganda, for example, and also to a connected global network of music, clubs, and scenes, stitched together, however loosely, through samples, set lists, sound clouds, and social media. We also have to look at local context, too. And although I haven't yet had the opportunity to conduct in situ research on Batida, uh, I will say something about Lisbon before returning to the broader world of global pop. I want to consider the segregation of sound and the way in which sound acts as a marker of place and regional identity, while simultaneously offering the promise of crossing borders, mixing, and miscegenating. My previous encounters uh, with the music of Lisbon have mostly been connected to the city's Fado music, which you heard Joao talking about um, just now, which I started researching in earnest around 15 years ago. So my work on Fado sought to emphasize the connection between Fado and the city of Lisbon, uh, as did the work of Michael Colvin and Lila Gray and others. And while I sought to question some of the more romantic narratives that have arisen around Fado as Portugal's national music, the soul of Portugal, to use a commonly found term, I arguably maintained the identification between country and music. So if you were to only take the word of academics like Gray or myself, you'd be forgiven for thinking to put a twist on a classic Fado song, that Fado e Kuru. We weren't alone, however. It's a position maintained uh, by world music industry too, from record labels and music festivals uh, to documentaries and magazines. 
So with regard to the World Music Network that developed in the 1980s and 1990s, by which I mean uh, the connected print, broadcast and online media, the concert and festival promoters, the specialist record labels and retailers, not to forget the world music audience, I've often felt that the end result is a kind of United Nations General Assembly, where each country or region is entitled to one representative artist, genre or style, who stands in for that body. So genre and nation are often conflated in this process, so that Spain is mostly represented by flamenco, Greece by rivetico, Argentina by tango, Mali by chora players or maybe rios, tuba by throat singers, and Portugal by faro. Batida arguably challenges the World Music Network in that it threatens to displace Fado as a music representative of Lisbon and Portugal. However, rather than thinking that the torch has been passed from Marisa to Marfox, it's probably more accurate to suggest that these sounds of Lisbon be seen to be taking place on a parallel network, another channel, uh, where what many have been calling World Music 2.0 or outer national music are hipper and more important than the trap tendencies of world music. So even though Pitchfork magazine described Mar Fox in 2014 as, quote, ambassador for this music around the world, uh, a role which artists such as Marisa and Anamora uh, had previously taken on for Fado, perhaps these worlds are unlikely, for the most part, to meet, meaning that we have multiple world music scenes out there, which is kind of the point being made by many musicians and writers in recent years. Um, just to briefly kind of look at some maps here, um, here's a kind of uh, a map of Lisbon, and um, this area here, this kind of downtown area, which is really, um, uh, as far as I understand, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this, this area would be the area that was really being covered in Joel's paper, and it's certainly the area that I've covered in my work on Fado, so the sort of downtown area around the Avenida de Libertad, down near the water. The music I'm talking about today, Batida, is music that comes from these outskirts, these uh, peripheral areas of uh, Greater Lisbon. So um, here's a few pictures as well of these uh, outskirts, which look, uh, I was going to include some pictures of downtown Lisbon. You've probably got a sense of what Lisbon looks like, public streets, lovely old buildings, uh, etc., etc. So these are quite uh, different areas, uh, these peripheral areas. So we can see that music maps onto different parts of the city. So there's a kind of physical separation here as well as a sonic one. But Batida is also about the, the, the making the best use of Web 2.0 and contemporary platforms. It started out as music that was file shared on eMule and similar platforms. And the dominant software used to make the music is, has been FL Studio, formerly known as Fruity Loops, uh, because it's easy to get hold of, both in terms of downloading and learning the software. So it's a music that's in and out and of place, uh, rooted in Africa, rooted through the diaspora, so Africa, Portugal, the rest of the world, and rooted through online networks. Um, this is also true of Baraka Sonsistema, the group I mentioned earlier, whose debut EP in, 20, in 2006 was titled in English, uh, From Baraka to the World, underlining the possibilities uh, of representation on the global stage. Um, oh, I've lost my map, but Baraka is, uh, is an area of Lisbon, um, uh, some way out of the city centre. <coughs> One of the group's members, DJ Riot, described the follow up album Black Diamond in 2008 as, quote, a trip around the world. And I'm just quoting from him here it starts in Angola, then goes to Portugal, and then goes to Brazil. These countries are all very connected. The Portuguese once took Angolan slaves to Brazil. As well as that, we drew on dubstep from the UK and went off to Sri Lanka a bit with MIA. That's the British Sri Lankan musician MIA. So it's an album about the world without the United States at its center, um, end quote. And that might be interesting to think about that in relation to what Joao was talking about in terms of um, the importation of uh, American dance cultures in that earlier period. So pushed on whether he saw the group as Paduro ambassadors to the world, DJ Riot was more circumspect, recognizing that theirs was a partial Lisbon-specific take on a music that would be experienced very differently in Luanda, uh, for all sorts of musical, historical, and socioeconomic reasons. 
What seemed more important was a global music network that somehow was not reliant on the dominant Anglo-American popular culture. The members of the Principe team, the record label I mentioned, like those of Buraka, recognized the inequalities of work between the metropolitan centers and the colonies that helped make them so. Yet they also draw strength from the cultural legacies of the Lucifer and Black Atlantic and simultaneously tap in to the networks of present and future. The music they release is tied to place and circumstance, but also Afrofuturist, an ever expanding collection of what Kodwa Ishan has called sonic fictions. As the 2016 compilation that the Principe put out um, would have it, this is a music from another world, both in emanating from a world that had virtually no representation in mainstream Portuguese culture and in being futuristically otherworldly. It's also otherworldly in its multi-mundiality, I think I've made that term up, but what I mean is sampling musics from around the world. Um, for me, says DJ Mar Fox, the most important quality of this music is that it allows me to go and drink from other sound sources and integrate what I want. You can influence yourselves, he says, and draw, music, and draw upon other strains of music and use what you see fit. I think that's the most fantastic and admirable quality, end quote. So we heard something of this in the DJ Ecox uh, track that I played earlier with its sampled photos. Um, I'll just play a couple more now. This is uh, DJ Marfox uh, looking east to the music of India. <laughs> Um, and this is Nidia Minaj, um, who is here remixing um, a song by the Brazilian um, singer, uh, Sao Paulo based singer Elza Suarez, so looking west. <laughs> expressing an outward rather than inward view. So while Fado um, might have been known as an international music, um, it was a global recognition of a national brand and a music that looked inward, uh, that took its multicultural roots and rebranded them through a nationalizing narrative. Hence all the disquiet when one tries to challenge the soul of uh, Portugal narrative. The international perspective, arguably, is happier to admit that the, inev the inevitability of musical miscegenation and is painfully aware of the legacies of separatist and marginalizing discourses. Um, just to take uh, one other example here, this is um, the record label Enchafada that puts out a lot of this uh, similar kind of music. Uh, this is a label that um, that's, uh, is, um, I don't know if it was set up, but certainly one of the main people involved with the label is um, a guy called Branco, who was a member of Buraka Sons Steyla, and these days produces other people's music as well. Um, and so in their mission statement, this is on um, Mixcloud here, they say, Enchufade is a record label on a mission, empowered by a highly contagious rhythmic virus incubated at tropical temperatures. We aim to contribute to this unstoppable pandemic that is changing the face of modern electronic dance music by introducing some much needed cultural flavor into the mix. Okay, um, I've got an aside here, which I don't think I've got time for, so I'll save it for later, which is just uh, about the Eurovision Song Con Contest that was on a few weeks ago, in which Branco uh, was involved, and I was surprised about that. Uh, the word encounter, uh, which um, provides part of my title, uh, has already appeared in my talk a few times, so I just want to finish off um, by focusing on encounter more intensely and listing several types of encounter uh, that I think are relevant to Batida and urban sound culture in Lisbon and beyond. 
So encounter can understood, be understood firstly perhaps as taking place between countries, not just different spaces, but different times, the colonial past, the post-colonial present, or the present of empire with capital E, as formulated by Hart and Negri. Also the future, that strange space from which some of this music is heard to emanate. At a more local level, uh, we have an uh, encounter between communities, the segregated center and periphery of Lisbon, but also the echo and imagination of the musettes of Luanda, these townships that, that pop up on the outskirts of Luanda. The DJs, the Guerto compilation, which uh, introduced uh, you know, the world to this Batida scene um, 12 years ago, along with African nights and clubs, brought together different communities from different suburbs uh, who didn't otherwise know of each other, but then kind of became a sort of, a kind of collective force, if you like. So there's an encounter between global styles, with Lisbon as a mediating center between Luanda and London, say, or Sao Paulo and Paris. There's also the encounter between bodies, dancing in clubs, and more generally with sound, uh, with being faced with sound and sonic bodies without the context of words or voices, mostly. And this, in turn, is an encounter between strangeness and familiarity. As a DJ, Mar Fox is smart enough to know that his dancer listeners will welcome some classic tunes that everyone knows, and he'll weave these in to his own compositions during his DJ sets. This kind of mixing is also an encounter, cross-fading between sonic worlds and competencies. There's also an encounter between bodies and minds. Some of this music has been described as cerebral, a kind of major crime for dance music, according to some critics. While given that these are DJs, it's understandable that the danceability of their music be analyzed in reviews. It's also the case that the narrative that connects this music only to the dancing, clubbing body is one that also relegates black music to cultural significance and uh, neglects aesthetics. So Nidia Minaj, for example, who I played earlier, um, the way that she uses chopped up vocals and mixes those with sounds. You know, this is experimental music and it uses technologies and techniques of EDM, but also other things as well. So this is another reason, I think, why the music shouldn't just be shut away from the rest of the city in nightclubs, but can be thought about outside of that space. Um, also, there's the encounter between mainstream and underground. Um, here it's worth thinking, uh, for example, of Richard Peterson's work on hardcore and soft shell music styles and cycles of production that Peterson and others have theorized, and which are also theorized and practiced by industry insiders. Uh, but he is exactly the kind of underground music that has the potential to influence mainstream music, uh, initially by a mediating DJ such as Branco, or people like Björk, or MIA, um, and then by more mainstream hit makers. And that may be the cause for some criticism along the lines that have been um, laid out against this music, but it's got this kind of flavor of the month aspect to it, um, which just picks up on different global sounds at different times. But it should also be understood as something that has historically driven the evolution of uh, popular music. Um, and then just finally, I should note my own encounter, I guess, with this music as someone who listens at the moment from a distance, uh, simultaneously thrilled and bewildered when one of these strange packages arrives in the post from this one. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very slightly. And uh, we move straight to our next speaker, Tom Whitaker from Warwick. Um, the title of this paper is Divian Speed and Rhythm. La Ruta del Bacalao in Spain. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so, I usually work on uh, Spanish film, and, and in recent years I've, becoming, uh, I've been becoming more interested in kind of the sonic aspects of Spanish film. Today I'm talking not about film, I'm talking just about sound. Okay, so this is my first foray really in, into sound without film. Okay, so I'm feeling like a bit of an, an imposter. Uh, but I'm yeah, very much looking forward to kind of hearing feedback, especially from these ecologists. Um, okay, so <clears throat> the, the name of my paper is Deviant Speed, Mapping Land in Bacalao. So uh, while much has been written 
uh, on the subcultures that came out of Madrid during Spain's transition to democracy, the sound cultures of Valencia have received little academic attention. Um, this paper explores the phenomenon known as La Ruta del Bacalao, a hugely popular dance scene that emerged from Valencia and radiated across the whole of Spain in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, the roots of the subculture can be traced back to the early 1980s in Valencian nightclubs such as La Barraca and Chocolate, which originally played music by um, British post-punk bands, new romantic bands, um, indie music. Um, by the late 1980s, however, uh, Valencian nightlife became more associated with dance music, techno music, um, with the Spanish version uh, of this sound evolving into a genre that became known and uh, much maligned as Bacalao. At the peak of its popularity, tens of thousands of clubbers descended upon clubs outside Valencia on what became known as the Ruta de Bacalao each weekend. Uh, under the influence of drink and drugs, some would carry on dancing from Thursday night on to uh, Monday morning, with many travelling all the way to Valencia from Madrid. Uh, in common with the British rave scene, uh, it fell victim to a widespread moral panic uh, by 1992, and this is a year that I'm going to be returning to throughout the paper. The subculture became associated with the excesses of designer drugs, uh, namely MDMA and speed, and of course frequent uh, road accidents. Um, so this paper explores the ways in which the soundscapes of La Ruta del Bacalao um, carved out their own distinctive and deviant set of spaces uh, and rhythms whose uh, speed and mobile nature gen generated considerable social anxiety in Spain at the time. So in seeking to map out these spaces, uh, this paper aims to explore the ways in which the phenomenon reflected the emergence of what I think were kind of new social transformations in Spain uh, at a time of great economic change. Okay, so I'm just going to play um, a clip from a documentary from uh, 1993, um, just to give you a flavour of the media representation of uh, the crane. <laughs> La discoteca, ¿no? De la que usted celebra su cuarto aniversario. Es una de las fiestas más fuertes de toda la ciudad. Miles de jóvenes en toda España siguen cada vez con más frecuencia una nueva moda. Fines de semana a toda marcha. La juega empieza los viernes y no termina hasta la madrugada del lunes. De una macro discoteca a otra. Música máquina, alcohol y las denominadas drogas de diseño son ingredientes básicos de tales fiestas. Valencia es, junto con Ibiza, uno de los paraísos de la música máquina. Allí existe un recorrido llamado Ruta de Stroy que permite encontrar ininterrumpidamente discotecas abiertas durante 72 horas. Nuestro programa de hoy les acerca al estilo de vida de un sector de jóvenes que busca su identidad construyéndose un mundo hecho a su medida, a toda pastilla. while the latter has become demonized. Uh, while both cultures were equally a celebration of hedonism, freedom, the Movida Valenciana and the subsequent Ruta del Bacalao became maligned not only because of its association with drugs and rogue accidents, but arguably also for its denigrated association with mainstream culture and its subsequent association with the masses. Um, in his uh, very recent book, Bacalao, 
the journalist and DJ Luis Costa provides the first published oral history of the scene. Um, in his spelling of the word bacalao, in which the, the deviant K uh, is replaced by the orthographically correct C, uh, Luis Costa seeks to reclaim the scene as an authentic cultural movement, uh, emphasising its flourishing creativity and individuality before it reached the mainstream. Um, Costa's book tellingly excludes any contributions from Chimo Bayo, um, the hugely popular Spanish dance artist who would become the commercial face of Bacalao, most known for his ecstasy-themed hit single, Esta Si, Esta No. Um, and, of course, La Mente del Bacalao is completely relegated to the margins of the narrative yeah, that he presents in this book. Um, so, in transforming itself from the hip and knowing underground into the mainstream, uh, the diffusion of Bacalao was dependent on a structure of mobility. Uh, if the initial Movida Valenciana was located in a set of specific nightclubs in the Valencian community, uh, the Bacalao dance craze spread across the whole of the country, with revelers following the sound across <coughs> several different routes. So, in tandem with the infamous route from Madrid to Valencia, Several other routes emerged across Spain. There was a route from Saragossa to Valencia, uh, a route de Andalucía, a route de Galicia, also a route de Catalonia, uh, which ran across the Costa Brava. Uh, Asturias even had its own route, uh, known amongst the locals as La Ruta del Bonito, <laughs> uh, <laughs> outside the town of Aviles, apparently. So, uh, if as sonic routes, uh, the rutas de Bacalao foregrounded the relationship between sand and movement, the question of mobility became freighted with great cultural meaning in Spain during this period too. So, as is well known, uh, 1992 was the year that consolidated Spain's place on the international stage as a truly modern, globalised and mobile nation. And so here I'm kind of foregrounding a different kind of route, and that's the roots of capital, global capital. Um, so we all know that you know, this is the year in which the Olympic Games were held in Barcelona, also the year in which Madrid was chosen as the European city of culture, so Spain has been now in the EU since uh, 1986. Um, the date also marked the quincentenary of Columbus's discovery of the Americas, um, Spain's founding moment of transnational movement and exchange, an event that was further celebrated in Seville's Expo that year, whose theme was the Age of Discovery. The Expo was inaugurated by the official, the, uh, sorry, by the official opening of the AVE high-speed railway route from Madrid to Seville. Um, Spain's surge of modernization during these years however, was marked by its unevenness, with many other regions of Spain feeling left behind by this recent influx of capital. Uh, Valencia, as uh, Spain's third city, was a case in point. Um, so the Valencian journalist Lopez Frias writes that during this year, or during that year, graffiti with the message España 92, Valencia 0, could frequently be seen on the walls across the city. Um, the accelerated pace of construction took place against a backdrop of economic recession in Spain, um, with unemployment reaching uh, a peak of 22% in 1993. Um, the causes of this employment crisis can, to an extent, be attributed to the process of what is euphemistically termed in Spanish um, Reconversión industrial, uh, which means uh, deindustrialization in, in English, which was passed by the socialist government, which cut jobs in Spain's state owned industries, mainly steel, coal, shipbuilding, and so on. So, in addition to all time high levels of unemployment, the percentage of precarious jobs uh, during this period, so jobs with no fixed contracts, um, by 1990, stood at 38%. Uh, so this is the highest rate in the whole of Europe at the time. 
So, in the decline of the structures of social democracy and the subsequent embrace of neoliberal policies, um, the socialist government accelerated Spain's passage into what Sigmund Bauman famously terms uh, liquid modernity. Um, so for Bauman, the temporality of liquid modernity is defined by a, and I quote, a collapse of long-term thinking, planning and acting, and the collapse of the social structures in which these are made possible. Um, he continues to write that this in turn brings about a splicing of both political history and individual lives into a series of short-term projects and episodes which are in principle infinite. Um, the hedonism of the Bacalao subculture, in which revelers sought to live for the present moment, is illustrated through the opening hours nightclubs during this period. Um, so the, the ritual of clubbing uh, at this time frequently depended on the constant deferral of the end of the party, with several nightclubs opening up what were known as after hours, yeah, los after. Um, so in a complete inversion of the usual rhythms of a nightclub, an after hours club were establishments where music would continue obviously, to be played during the daytime, often well into the hours of the afternoon. Continuing to dance without sleep, the times at which Bacalao was heard were frequently out of sync with the rhythm, rhythms of everyday life, complicating the distinctions between the day and night, light and dark, and I want, want to return to this idea of you know, sync or out of sync, synchronicity, uh, in Spanish, desfase, yeah? as you get the expression, que desfase in Spanish, so I'm going to be returning to that in the conclusion. Um, many of the nightclubs on the Rutas de Bacalao were located in industrial spaces, or former industrial spaces that had been closed down as a result of this process of deindustrialization. So returning to Aviles, um, in the, which was uh, a shipbuilding centre, businesses who had previously provided repairs for machinery for shipbuilding um, sold their businesses, uh, sold their sorry, sold their buildings to nightclub owners who were then, in turn, using them as after-hour clubs. So, um, the repurposing of the buildings from spaces of production into spaces of consumption, uh, from spaces of labour uh, into spaces of leisure, uh, reflects the broader socio-economic transformations that were ushered in by Reconversión Industrial. In areas such as Aviles, that were once governed by Fordist rhythms of industrial labour, whose fixed working hours provided both continuity and stability for the area, the emergence of Bacalao signalled a definitive break with these rhythms, and more crucially, with the social structures to which these rhythms gave meaning. Um, and uh, the legacy of manufacturing can be found, possibly in the term musica machina, uh, or simply Machina, a name that was used synonymously with Bacalao, first coming into commercial use, I don't think you can see it, <laughs> yeah, the, the first, that first came into commercial use with the release of the 1991 compilation album Machina Total. Um, so that's there, you call that. Um, the, the origins of the name Machina are debated with some attributing it to the electronic music technology that made the sound possible, okay, namely the Roland drum machines and TV bass synthesizers. Others, however, trace the term to the spaces in which this music was consumed, pointing to the pattern of nightclubs frequently opening up in industrial parks on the edges of cities where lorries, cranes and other machines could be found. Um, for Bauman, uh, the liquid modern person uh, adopts a nomadic movement uh, whose survival in an increasingly flexible and volatile world depends on moving and acting faster. Um, a similar kind of nomadic movement 
and finds its expression in the Bacalao subculture, um, and particularly through the centrality of the car to the whole scene. Um, not only was the car logistically necessary, um, given the long distances between nightclubs and the location of nightclubs on the edges of the city, but it was firmly integrated into the visual iconography of the dance scene. Uh, car tuning was a, common, was a common practice amongst many clubbers, uh, a practice whereby the appearance of the vehicle is modified by its owner. Car tuning frequently involved the installation of more powerful quality speakers and subwoofers, which amplifies bass frequencies. Um, these modified cars were crucial to the phenomenon known as El Parquineo, where clubbers would congregate in the car parks adjacent to nightclubs in the hours between clubs closing and the opening. Sometimes it would just be a question of one or two hours. Yeah. Um, here, the car replaced the function of the DJ. As clubbers opened their car doors and played music at high volume from the car speakers. Uh, so you know, this, this idea of the, the car, the car speakers connecting the vehicle to kind of the greater assemblage of the crowd. Um, I've got an, an extract here, so if we move six. En una de las grandes um, yeah, just before I get that, um, yeah, I've, I've missed something out from my paper in this version. But also, um, <laughs> many of the clubbers would bring with them um, kind of wooden boards that they would strap to the roof of their cars as a kind of uh, mobile dance floor, okay, so which we're, we're um, it's a kind of like mini podium, which we'll see now. El niño tiene 22 años. Trabaja con su padre en la construcción. El fin de semana se transforma en lo que llaman en Valencia un cañero. Sale de fiesta el viernes y no vuelve a casa antes del domingo por la noche. Para Emilio la marcha empezó a los 18 años con el carnet de conducir. Para no faltar a ninguna cita de la ruta, Emilio llega a recorrer más de 100 kilómetros en una noche. Emilio, ¿para qué sirve eso? Está para bailar. Ahí había bailado. Había una maletera y bailado. speakers of the car into the crowd uh, appears to vividly illustrate how sound can uh, reconfigure questions of space. Um, in his book, Acoustic Territories, Brandon LaBelle shows how, I quote, the temporal and evanescent nature of sound imparts great flexibility and uncertainty to the stability of space. Uh, writing further that sound is able to displace and replace the lines between inside and out, uh, above and below. Um, the increased media coverage and subsequent mistrust with the government's ability to deal with this, uh, what was perceived as 
social disorder uh, led to the passing of La Ley de Seguridad Ciudadana that was, most, that was more popularly known as La Ley Corfuera, okay, which was named after the Minister of the Interior at the time. The passing of this law was interesting. It was passed in 1992, so um, Spain's great year of movement, of opening up. Uh, yet the law sought to contain the very structure of mobility, which is seen as a kind of sonic mobility, on which Bacalao depended. So we've got kind of two structures of mobility kind of emerging at the same time. And the kind of Bacalao is a kind of like a distorted, kind of dark, well, mirror image of the official mobility, maybe. Um, the law made it possible for police to search premises without a warrant and increase roadside alcohol and drug tests on all of the major roads of the several rutas de Bacalao. Uh, most crucially, the law sought to contain sand uh, in both its temporal and spatial expression. So it sought to regulate uh, opening hours and ban mobile discos, so kind of mini bars on wheels, um, and clubs that were set up in tents. Uh, in November 1993, the law allowed 553 arrests to take place in just one weekend across several different routes. Um, as the craze for the Hotel Bacalao began to fade by the late 1990s, um, metaphors of speed and velocity never, nevertheless lived on, resurfacing with increasing prominence in the Spanish economy. Um, this period ushered in what became known in the Spanish commercial sector as Spanish high speed. Uh, an accelerated house building frenzy and series of ostentatious public building projects. And we all know that the result of this was a great big crash. Yeah, so the big banking crash of 2007. Uh, Valencia, of course, has become a particularly symbolic city for financial corruption, overspending, with many of its extravagant buildings and public projects from the boom years now like empty. In his book, uh, Rhythm Analysis, Henry Lefebvre writes that, I quote, objectively, for there to be a change, a social group, a class or a caste, must intervene by imprinting a rhythm on a neighbor, be it through force or in, or in, an, or in an insinuating manner. In the course of a crisis, in a critical situation, a group must designate itself as an innovator or producer of meaning, and its acts must inscribe themselves on reality. Anyway, um, if, the de if the deviant rhythms of Bacalao pointed to, an, um, pointed to an, an emerging set of social relations in Spain, the new reality to which it gestured was one that was shaped, as we have seen, by volatility, flexibility, um, one that was overseen by a government whose policies followed the interests of the flows of accelerated capital rather than the interests of ordinary people. Moving towards a kind of tentative conclusion, um, I think it's intriguing that this 1992 law, La Ley Corfuera, was later updated and re replaced by the Partido Popular in 2015 with La Ley Mordaza, okay, which means which is the gag law. Um, as is well known, the law came into effect after the anti austerity demonstrations of the indignados, who, like those on the ruta before them, have similarly been constructed as kind of noisy, deviant, kind of excessive subjects to the social order. Like La Ley Contuera, La Ley Mordaza sought to impose social order through silencing, silencing the crowd. Um, so reviewed now, uh, in what is coming up to be the 10th year of imposed austerity in Spain, the desfacing, so this lack of synchronization of Bacalao, 
um, is joyful refusal to synchronise with the rhythms of everyday life can be read as a broader metaphor for how the material reality spells itself out of sync with the modernised image it sought to present. Okay, thank you. So, um, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure um, and it's a great honour to be able to uh, present our keynote speakers from all the way from New York, uh, Professor Katie Vernon from Stony Brook. Now, uh, Katie is a specialist, as we all know, in Spanish film, and she really was the first person to um, start to explore Spanish film as a kind of audio vision culture rather than just a kind of visual culture. So uh, her work has been very kind of pioneering uh, in this area. Uh, her present monograph that she's completing is entitled Listening to Spanish Cinema. We're very much looking forward to reading it. And, uh, and a recent edited volume uh, that she um, published was a bit companion to her as well. Um, so today, um, Katie's going to be giving a talk entitled Desperately Seeking Cecilia, Voice, Accent and Identity in Spanish Film. Okay, so thanks, Katie. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom and Samuel. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here to see old friends and new friends and uh, to, to get into this. Um, so the work I present here today builds on several years of research publications and talks dealing with, some might say obsessed with, the role of sound, voice, and music in Spanish language cinema and in the Spanish film industry in particular. And it's a delight to gather here with a number of my fellow obsessives about sound. Um, my initial approach to the topic, my apprenticeship in listening and thinking about voices in cinema came in studies of song in the films of Pedro Almodóvar. This immersion in the textual, contextual, and cultural meanings of musical voices led me to look beyond their semantic and signifying function to a consideration of the materiality of voices as sonic phenomena produced and received by bodies and shaped and reshaped and transmitted by sound reproduction technologies. In designating my object of study, I adopt the term proposed by ethnomusicologist Amanda Weidman of vocal practices a phrase that acknowledges the layered mix of social and cultural codings and meanings, bodily agency, and technological interventions involved in the production and reception of vocal sounds, speech, and singing. To this matrix, I would add, when talking about the production and reception of film, sound, and voices in Spain, as we are here, the peculiar effects of government film policies, artistic and commercial imperatives, namely the use of post-synchronized sound to, during the, the long stretch of Spanish film history, and spectator habituation that I would label the Spanish cinematic politics of voices. In short, I'll start by talking about the impact of dubbing. The technique and technology of in film of vocal replacement, the substitution of an original performer's voice with a second actor's voice in the dubbing studio. Dubbing has had few defenders among cultural and cinema critics and creators. For most commentators, the choice of dubbing over the use of subtitles in responding to a need for what Natasha Durovikova calls cinema trans translatio that arose from the crisis, her word, or actually someone else's word, provoked in world cinema by the introduction of synchronized sound in spoken dialogue, that choice is not a neutral one. In the words of Durovikova, when the protocols for linguistic transfer were being set internationally between 1928 and 1933, every element of the decision to translate a film, which language to use, what procedure, where to execute it, under what set of rules, immediately became a matter of a specific set of transnational power relations, end quote. In his study of global film translation, Cinema Babel, Abe Mark Norn, Norn is, don't know how to pronounce his name, recognizes the force of habit and the influence of an economically potent dubbing industry as well as factors in countries where dubbing persists today. In Europe, the so-called figs, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, and, and Japan not in Europe. Um, while 
he also signals the role, so in, in addition to habit, right, signals the role of, quote, a relationship to the foreign, with certain forms of nationalism, preferring the cultural and linguistic insularity capable in, uh, capable in dubbing. Norm continues, whereas subtitles grant access to both meaning and the foreign grain of the voice, dubbing retains only sound effects and music. The foreign language is completely extracted and replaced with sameness. End quote. While acknowledging both subtitling and dubbing as domesticating modes, Norns lingers on the historical relationship of dubbing to nationalism and fascism at its earlier <coughs> moment, a linkage that he says confirms our worst suspicions toward dubbing as essentially deracinating, deodorizing imperial. End quote. Beyond this ideological aspect to which I will return, objections to dubbing generally fall into two, although not unrelated, camps or categories. In the first, the emphasis is on all that is lost with the silencing of an original voice in favor of another. Weidman has written of the axiomatic notion within Western, the Western metaphysical and linguistic traditions that holds the voice as a guarantor of truth and self-presence, an expression of self and identity. From Latin dollar, quote, the voice is like a fingerprint, instantly recognizable and identifiable. We can almost unfailingly identify a person by the voice, the particular individual timbre, resonance, pitch, cadence, melody, the peculiar way of producing certain sounds, end quote. According to such widely shared views, then, individual voices are unique, and how much more so in the case of professional actors trained to wield their vocal instrument in the expression of their art. Martin Schindler, for one, has championed a new focus in film studies on actors' vocal performances, the dramatic human voice. As he writes in his 2012 book, Star Studies, quote, the voice is a distinctive and defining feature of a star's persona, end quote. So seen and heard in this light, dubbing the represents an attack on the professional achievement, on professional achievement and artistic integrity, and in the hierarchical value structure of the star system, a bad bargain as well. Tom Whitaker suggestively traces the origins of the word dub, which he notes came into English usage in the 1920s, as a shortened form of the word double, also reflected in Spanish doblar, French doublé, all derived from Latin duplare from duplus the root of the word duplicity. As early as 1932, Borges was denouncing the perverse artifice they call dubbing, which offers chimera and monsters that combine the well-known features of Greta Garbo with the voice of Aldo San Lorenzo. A number of critics and writers have invoked the term ventriloquism or vamp even vampirism with one actor, one voice actor cited as describing the dubbing process as crawling into the body of the screen actor. In the Child in Spanish Cinema, Sarah Wright explores and brilliantly exploits in her readings of signal films from the 1950s corpus of Cine con Niños, the uncanny, spectral, and even monstrous effects of the common practice in Spain of using adult female dubbing actors to provide child voices. Analyzing films such as Marcelino Panivino, Ian Maestro, she writes of dubbing as, quote, process of devouring, of assimilation of one body by another, at once a theft and a prompting of the child voice. In my own previous work, I set forth a third category with respect to the negative consequences of dubbing in the Spanish acoustic representational space namely the imposition of a vocal orthodoxy, a set of conventionalized and standardized vocal practices and voice types derived from the pervasive auditory presence of dumb voices that shape, limit, and arguably deform the sonic habits and habitus of cinematic experience in Spain. Most of the writing and research on the history of Spanish dubbing has dealt with its ideological consequences, especially the opportunity it presented to Franco-era censors who actively rewrote dialogue in the passage from the original language to Spanish in the attempt to cleanse films of their transgressive political or sexual charge. Tom and Sarah's work are the major exceptions to this tendency to only focus on what happened in Mo Mogambo, for example. Right? And actually, I think it's no accident that work like ours is being undertaken by non-native listeners. Yeah. 
Although the practice of dubbing initially took hold during the Republic with the first Spanish dubbing studios established in Barcelona beginning in 1932, as is well known, the Franco regime made dubbing obligatory, although the 23 April 1941 ministerial order proclaiming the fact was never published as it was required in the Boletín Oficial del Estado and it appeared instead in print in the Falanges film magazine Primer Plano which subsequently became the central venue for bitter denunciations of the dubbing law on the part of critics, directors, and producers who regarded it as a dagger to the heart of the national film industry. Thus, the history of dubbing in Spain might be seen to offer an emphatic confirmation of Norn's suspicions regarding the practice's xenophobic intentions and effects. But beyond the, the contaminating effects of foreign voices and ideas, I'm driven to explore what else, whether other sounds and sonic phenomena, dubbing works to screen out or in. In the first place, one can point to its limiting effects on vocal style and performance. Norns quotes the Japanese film and film dubbing director Harada Masato, who worked on the Japanese version of Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket who testifies to the fact that, quote, voice actors have developed a highly conventionalized style used exclusively for their trade. No one speaks that way. With respect to the Spanish case, in his study of Woody Allen's Spanish vocal double, Juan Pera, Tom Whitaker can contrast the sharp nasal timbre of Allen's voice in his films with Pera's more melodious and phonogenic voice that is arguably more pleasurable to listen to. In a competitive film industry, he continues, I'm quoting Tom again, a phonogenic voice is pivotal to the success of a dubbing artist. As Tom has explored elsewhere, such standards and vocal conventions also shape the performance style of established Spanish actors, such as Jose Luis Lopez Vasquez and Alfredo Landa, who thanks to the Spanish practice of posting sound, Quoting Tom, we're used to dubbing their own voices with their enunciated and clipped vocal performances closely resembling those of dubbed performances of foreign language actors. In Spain, as in other dubbing countries such as Italy, such vocal norms imposed an emphasis on beauty and correction, standardized pronunciation, conventionally attractive voices. Norms reports on a casting director in Italy for The Godfather who replaced Marlon Brando's iconic raspy delivery with what he believed to be a better voice. <coughs> and this is the casting director. In Italian, we got rid of Brando's scratchy American voice. He has a good voice now, and now he's a great actor. <laughs> and right in a uh, footnotes, a 1952 article from Prima Plano describing a debate on the virtues of dubbing in which a participant made a claim that Gracias a las películas dobladas, la gente de los pueblos aprende el castellano más correctamente. <laughs> so I'm going to my first clip. Okay. Um, I'm going to play this very familiar and much analyzed clip from Mujeres al Borde de un ataque de nervios that in many ways really says it all, although I think we'll be able to say a few new things. Okay. So, Developments for the, actually the continuation of the same scene from the film. Unfortunately, the sound of this is not great. Arturo, por esposo. Gracias, quiero. No voy a venir. 
lo que Dios ha unido, él no lo separe. Podemos besarnos ya, Rani. Y mi mente se gira. No, 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 Anna Luber's brilliant exploitation of the dramaturgy of dubbing and the temporal and spatial displacements usually masked spectators crystallizes this dysfunctional desamor, the melodramatic disencounters of the lovers Ivan and Pepa, with Ivan's sinuous and seductive voice, the very incarnation of the dubber's duplicity. But rather than re their revoicing of the Hollywood classic Johnny Guitar, I'd like to focus here on the other scene dubbed that we just saw by Carmen Maura, a seemingly throwaway bit of comic insinuation, evocative of the TV adverts included in several of his, her, his earlier films. It would seem to be a mock PSA. Do you say that public service announcement? Yeah, okay. About the need to use a condom, and we know there were campaigns to that effect during the period. Epa Maura is shown dubbing the lines of a blushing bride played by the character we will soon come to know as the Andalusian innocent and cast catastrophe prone Candela, played by the Malaga-born actor is Maria Barranco. In contrast to her work providing Joan Crawford's Vienna with a Spanish voice, in this instance, Pepa is engaged in an act of intra intralingual dubbing, replacing Candela's non-standard voice and accent with the typical and conventional sounds of the professional dubber voice actor in their purest form, as heard in TV adverts. Nords characterizes intralingual dubbing as one of the oddest forms of vocal replacement, describing it as unusual and unusually domesticating. In, in his book, he's talking about the cases of the Mad Max films, also studied in, in Tom and Sarah's collection, Locating the Voice, as well as films by Ken Loach, both cases motivated by transnational commercial calculations with the goal of reaching a U.S. audience. In Spain, the justifications and motivations lie elsewhere, with the most notorious cases of Spanish dubs of Spanish actors, uh, speaking actors being those of women dubbing children, right? Um, a practice that has persisted at least to my ears into the 1990s. Fortunately, I don't hear a lot of Spanish dub films. Um, or, yeah. Um, and cases involving the rejection of gender atypical voices, such as actor Emma Pineda, whose di distinctive grainy and sensual voice was considered insufficiently microfonica, which is an interesting term, in, which we can talk about. But my focus today, as promised in my title and the Almodovar clip, is on the suppression or not of accents and accented voices. Although by no means a literal study of accents in cinema, Hamid Nafisi's 2001 book, An Accented Cinema, offers a significant reference point for our discussions. Taken initially by Nafisi as a marker of difference from the norm, Accent serves the Iranian-American scholar as a way to contrast the thematic and formally divergent body of work produced by exilic and diasporic filmmakers against a dominant cinema, quoting Nafisi, considered universal and without accent. Cultural critics and linguists concur in this understanding of accent as deviation from what is nevertheless, according to sociolinguist Rosina Lippi Green, an abstraction or myth the notion of standard language and non-accent. And yet, con continues Nafisi, while in linguistics all accents have equal standing, technically, quote, all accents are not of equal value socially and culturally, end quote. Writing of Australian accents in film, Rebecca Coyle details the indexal function of the accented voice in signifying class ethnicity, and other aspects of social positioning. Accents thus bind to social and cultural hierarchies, with several commentators noting the role that accents play in determining access to media expression, and especially positions of vocal authority. Dollar writes, for example, I quote, imagine someone reading the evening news on TV with a heavy, heavy, heavy regional accent. 
it would sound absurd, for the state, by definition, does not have an accent. Close quote. Libby Green further signals the othering force of vocal discrimination, noting how accents serve as, quote, the first point of gatekeeping, whereby a voice with a foreign phonology becomes a litmus test for exclusion and excuse to turn away, a, a refusal to recognize the other, end quote. The stakes of such struggles over access and authority, identity and belonging, and cultural and commercial dominance linked to voices and accents are dramatically on display in the early history of sound cinema in Spanish. As numerous film historians have recounted, the so-called Spanish versions, films produced by Paramount and Fox in Hollywood and outside Paris in an attempt to su supply the transcontinental Spanish-speaking market, set the stage for what became known as the War of Accents. As Lisa Jarvinen writes, with the introduction of sound, suddenly an actor's nationality or ethnicity might be revealed not only by physiognomy, but orally by speech." End quote. While casting choices that intermix Colombian, Mexican, Argentine, and Spanish actors and accents into, say, a single family in a film, clearly challenged notions of fictional coherence and verisimilitude, there were also bigger geocultural and political considerations at work. Despite Hollywood's tin ear, both literally and metaphorically speaking, when it came to notions of ethnic identity or national distinction among non-Anglo populations, it soon became evident to those involved in the production and promotion of these films, as Jarvina notes, that Spanish could divide rather than unify its speakers. English language trade publications like Variety offer ample documentation of the conflicts. An article from December 1929 taps into the difficulties in finding a general accent to satisfy spectators from Spain as well as across the Americas. Quote the article, actors having Castilian accents are satisfying just a small portion of the Spanish-speaking countries. All speak Spanish, understandable to each other, but Hollywood is worried about how to get away from the Castilian accent monopoly. Just a month later, in January 1930, a Madrid-based correspondent for Variety gives voice to Spanish audiences' rejection of, quote, the doggerel Spanish of Latin American artists, which is difficult to understand here. And there's a lot more of this, believe me. Um, Certainly much changed with the subsequent surge in cross-Atlantic traffic in film stars from Jorge Negrete and Carmen Sevilla to Sara Montiel, Hugo de Carril, and Jorge Mistral, and the growth of Spanish-Latin American co-productions beginning in the late 1940s. Spanish film historian Diego Galán writes of a temporary truce in the language wars during the 1950s and 60s among the three most powerful Spanish film language, uh, Spanish language film industries in Mexico, Spain, and Argentina, in which performers spoke in a neutral Spanish that he describes as sophisticated, unreal, and as distant from the popular language spoken in the street as from the most educated Spanish." End quote. By the 1970s, however, the situation has seemingly regressed with the accentual barriers back in place. During the 80s and 90s, Galan reports, Latin American films had virtually disappeared from Spanish screens, and the few that did circulate were the object of intralingual dubbing. And he cites the egregious examples of Torres, Nilsson's Martin Fierro, Raúl de la Torre's Crónica de una Señora, in which Graciela Borges, he writes, la típica porteña hablaba en un ortodoxo Bailly solo, soletano, right? A Bailolid accent. Um, I turn now, finally, to my two, I guess I got a slide already, uh, my two primary textual case studies that focus on the careers in Spain of two non Spanish actors. The first, no spoiler, uh, Argentine performer Cecilia Roth, and the second, the Anglo American performer Geraldine Chaplin. Arriving in Spain approximately a decade apart, in the mid-1960s for Chaplin and 1976 in the case of Roth, both artists confronted the challenge of making their way in a foreign film industry in an era in which, comments Roth, 
lo del acento era una cosa tan incorporado al cine español que no podía actuar nadie que no hablara un castellano perfecto. Um, so, okay. Um, so here's a slide. Roth was dubbed, as you can see in the first films, as indicated in a scan from the internet-based archive and searchable database, eldoblaje.com. It's sort of a fascinating site, part employment office, part nostalgia trip, and really an interesting document in the recuperation of, of cultural and historical sonic memory in Spain. It's not complete, though. Um, but it, you know, you can see her first films, which they were, who she's dubbed by, and, and who the character was. Right? In a series of published conversations, Roth goes on to detail her strenuous, strenuous efforts to perfect the required Castilian accent. A mí me preocupaba mucho. Daba clases de dicción e incluso creo que me volví un poco esquizofrénica. Empecé a mentalizarme de que había nacido aquí, a tratar de grabarme esa idea en el cerebro, porque además los personajes que tenía que interpretar eran españoles. No tenían nada que ver con mi propia historia. She concludes, being dubbed era mi sino. Hasta Pedro me dobló en Pepe Lucibón y otras chicas del montón. There's also a voice sample of her reading for an advert for Lentes Progresivas by Looks. Mm -hmm. So this is where people, they, I mean, they're vocal samples for a number of dubbing actors, and clearly it's a you know, sort of calling card mm -hmm. for uh, employment. So um, for her next film with Almodóvar, Laberinto de Pasiones, Roth would graduate to the protagonizing role of Sexilia. Heard who we will hear in dialogue with her Argentine psychiatrist, uh, Susana. <laughs> Roth has neutralized her own Argentine accent. In their study of Roth's initial film career in Spain, before her return to Argentina in 1985, Carmen Sier and Manuel Palacio are highly critical of the failure of the Spanish film industry to provide receptive space for artists like Roth to develop their careers, and they write, as a foreigner, she is subject to the amputation of part of her body, namely her voice. In some films, with the excuse that Spanish cinema doesn't accept accents that aren't from Valladolid, she's dubbed. In others, including art cinema production, she's obliged to erase all traces of her Argentine accent and dialect and to adopt a neutral Spanish that to spectator ears could be from anywhere or nowhere." End quote. Writing of the suppression of film accents as the sound of racism, Philip Broth Brophy is harsher still. He's not talking about Cecilia Roth, but uh, in general. 
quote, the removal of the sound of an original accent is always problematic. The replacement of it with another can be culturally traumatic. Not only is the cultural timbre of the voice erased, but it is replaced in a way that figures the act of replacement as necessary, desirable, and worse, commendable. Thus, all the more striking is the sound of Ross' return to Spanish cinema, that is, cinema made in Spain, in Anna Lobart's 1999 film, Todo Sobre Mi Madre. Although likely not the first time Spanish film goers had the opportunity to listen to Ross' original voice, given the wide distribution of two Argentine Spanish co productions directed by Adolfo Aristarain, Un Lugar en el Mundo in 92, 1992, the multiple Goya winning Martin Ache in 1997, not to mention the case of Maria Luisa Benberg's biography of Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, Yola Peor de Todas, in which Roth memorably lends her voice to the uh, Virreina, played by Dominique Sanda. It was certainly the first time that audiences heard uh, her Argentine voice in a, in a film by Almodovar. So this is just the first time she speaks in Todo Sobre Mi Madre. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? Soy Manuela de Bonita Jal. Dime, Manuela. Tenemos un posible donante. Se le ha hecho el primer efecto de cefalograma y ya tenemos el tratamiento familiar. A ver, los datos. Es un varón de 35 años. ¿Grupo sanguíneo? Cero positivo. Pesa alrededor de 70 kilos. Let us linger a moment on the texture and quality of Ross' real voice in the role of Manuela, her husky yet warm and mature vocal instrument, quite distant from the frothy ingenue heard in Labyrinto de Pasiones. In his study of the semiotics of the voice in cinema, Theo van Leuven offers us a useful descriptive and analytic framework for evaluating the impact and implications of different vocal types and textures. Van Leuven questions the division established by Roland Barthes and others like Kajef Silverman between the communicative and the sensorial functions of the voice, what Silverman identifies as meaning and materiality, insisting instead that the voice and its meaning can only be understood as the product and expression of corporeal experience. Nevertheless, there are voices and vocal types that more clearly embody that materiality as well as the traces of personal history. The husky or rough voice of an actress like Roth or Penella, and Diego Galan memorably describes Penella's voice in El Verdugo as a voz sucia. Um, this kind of voice is read by Van Leuven, and I think more generally, as the product of, quote, wear and tear, whether it's the result of smoking and drinking, hardship and adversity, or old age. As such, that kind of voice is the opposite of the more standard, smooth, polished, and clean voice from which any excess or noise has been eliminated. An apt characterization of the conventional feminine voices deployed in film dubbing and TV commercials in Spain, a manifestation of which we just heard in the clip from Pepe Lucy Bon. In certain cultural contexts, notes Van Leuven, voices with grain and history are prized as bearers of wisdom and or especially potent emotional charge. In Todo Sobre Mi Madre, these connotations of experience and hard-won wis wisdom bind to Ross performance, lending gravity to her portrayal of this sorrowful but not resigned Mater Dolorosa. I would point especially to these uh, the orally charged moment of her son Esteban's death, marked by Manuela's shattering cry of pain. Although I think it's also fascinating for thinking about these questions of voice and authenticity, the fact that she will reprise that cry later in the film in her performance as Stella, where she replaces the drug addict Nina in A Streetcar Named Desire. There is, of course, another striking feature of the character's voice that owes to the recovery of the actress's native accent, and with it, Roth's Argentine identity. In an analysis of Todo Sobre Mi Madre, Juan Carlos Ibanez traces the incorporation of Roth's uh, own biography. She was born Cecilia Rotenberg Roth. Um, her early 
formation in the flourishing experimental theater scene in Buenos Aires, her flight in 1976 from direct threats to her family in Argentina, and subsequent exile in Spain along with her parent and brother, parents and brother, as intertext in Todo Sobre Mi Madre. In the film, Roth reclaims not just her voice and accent, but also the links between personal identity and collective history. As Nafisi knows, accent, in addition to its role as a marker of individual difference in personality, is also, quote, one of the most intimate and powerful markers of group identity and solidarity. And in Todo Sobre Mi Madre, it's clear that, um, that, well, the film exploits that intersection between the two to very powerful ends. My second case study steps back in film history. There's no evolutionary progress or enlightenment in the reception or inclusion of foreign accents to report here. It is not a coincidence, however, that these two sonically complex examples center on the collaboration between actors from outside Spain and two of the nation's most notable acoustic auteurs, to use the term proposed by Jay Beck to refer to filmmakers who construct personal sound aesthetics that rework the rules of sound and image relations. As Patricia Hart and others have documented, Almodovar and Saura were the first Spanish directors to insist on using direct sound, the latter at the urging of Geraldine Chaplin, rather than rely on post synchronization as was the standard practice in the Spanish industry. Still, in contrast to the linear tale of seeking or suppression, suppressing, and finally finding Cecilia Ross' voice in Almodovar's films, that of Geraldine Chaplin's voice in Saura films is a much more complicated and layered story, and one that El Doblaje that kind of notably fails to capture. Right? Um, I mean, here she's listed as, well, she plays two characters in Peppermint, Frappe, and one is dubbed. Um, this was the Pedro Olea film where she's dubbed, and she dubs herself in La Madriguera, but she was also dubbed very audibly in Stress uh, is Trace Trace and Cria Cuervos in one of the roles she plays there. So Chaplin made eight films with Saura between 1967 and 1979, beginning with Peppermint Frappe and ending with Mama Cumple Cien Años. She was dubbed into Castellano in four of them. In five, she plays a non-Spanish character and speaks in her own accent of voice in Spanish. But there are overlaps, since in at least three of the films, she plays dual roles. And in two, Cria Cuervos and Elisa Vida Mia, she speaks in her own voice, playing ostensibly Spanish characters. The Spanish press paid a good deal of attention to Chaplin, and, and even a bit to her accent. She, the daughter and granddaughter of Anglo-American cinematic and literary royalty, and the ultimate cosmopolitan mobile voice to use Whitaker and Wright's term, acting in three languages and fresh off her 1965 role in Dr. Zhivago. Characterization of her voice in interviews and critical appraisals of her vocal performances in, these press, uh, in this press coverage um, were not surprisingly mixed. Pueblo, 1974. Geraldine, de voz rubia, entre whiskey y tabaco americano. Uh, Arriba, 74, hablan un español pasado por USA, meloso, acariciante, irritante, a veces. Arriba, 76, acentillo suave que casi llega a ser castellano. And in post Saura, 1984, domina perfectamente el castellano e incluye en sus términos algunos chilenismos, she had a Chilean partner, que pronunciados con acento gringo provocan risa. 
Regarding her voice in films, one critic writes of Crio Cuervos, in which la esplendida interpretación de Geraldine Chaplin quizás se vea empeñada a veces por su acento distanciador. Um, while another critic in ABC, after praising as descarrada, onda, verdadera, her work in the film in scenes depicting the mother character's death agonies, then notes the loss of her voice when doblada en los planos en que interpreta a Ana Joven, that is the Ana Torren character grown up. Hueca la seguridad de la dicción por la encantadora ternura de su acento en las otras escenas. Right. Chaplin's own evaluation of her native English, or L1 accent, as the linguists say, highlights a certain undefinability. En los Estados Unidos dicen que mi acento es muy inglés, pero en Inglaterra sucede todo lo contrario. If, as Libby Green observes, Accent can only be understood if there's something to compare it with, to the extent that your speech is different from my speech, and your prosodic features and phonology mark you as someone from someplace else, then Chaplin provides an example of a permanent someplace or even no place else. And Chaplin uh, kind of finalizes that last quote, Creo que mi acento no es de ninguna parte. Um, question on her accent in Spanish, her L2 accent, specifically her self-dubbing in the last post-sync sound film with Saura, La Madriguera, she replies, A mí me dicen que no está muy bien el doblaje que hice en La Madriguera, pero como no tengo buen oído para el español, no me doy cuenta, aunque me parece que está muy bien. Chaplin and Saura would put the dislocating and disruptive qualities of her accent to work in films like Peppermint Frappe and Ana y los Lobos, where her voice accentuates, we could say, the character's unsettling allure and exotic threat that provoke the male protagonist to destroy and expel the foreign body from the national organism. Although there is much more to be said and made from her dual performance, voicing in Peppermint Frappe, in which, as the duplicitous Elena, she keeps her voice while donning a blonde wig, whereas dubbed in the role of the mousy office assistant Anna, she initially offers a visual reprise of her breakout role two years earlier in Dr. Shivago as the young wife of the title character cast aside for the blonde and captivating Lara, played by Julie Christie. So if Ross' Argentine accent functions as a marker of authenticity and the immutable bonds between voice and identity, I would argue that Chaplin's accent points toward very different meanings. But these first roles and vocal practices remain within the norm, domesticating and containing the discordant voices and accents through dubbing or the alibi provided by the character's foreign origins, in Chaplin's words as la peligrosa estrangera de siempre. I propose instead to focus on the two films and two performances where Chaplin's characters notably read as Spanish, but speak as someone from someplace else. I will play three clips by way of example or sample. In the first two from Cria Cuervos, we see and hear Chaplin in two roles, as the memory image of the mother Maria, of the film's child protagonist, Anna, and in the second from a series of recurring monologues given dubbed voice giving dubbed voice to the adult Anna some 20 years later. The third clip is taken from the beginning of Elisa Vida Mia, in which Elisa, initially in voiceover, reads the text of a memoir written by her father.
insisting on the powerful influence exercised on the, on the director by La existencia de una actriz como Geraldine Chaplin. He points to the impact of su acento ambiguamente deslocalizado and described as el habla singular, diferente y monstruoso de Geraldine Chaplin. A way of speaking, he continues, that is una, una invitación al vacío, a lo que está por ver, a lo desconocido, al horror. Without entering into the somewhat scattered arguments by Hernandez Lez, what his comments clearly foreground is the power of Chaplin's voice and the vocal practices generated by and around it to unsettle and disturb stable notions of temporal and spatial coherence, as well as narrative identity and authority. I do have a couple more pages where I sort of go into those clips, but I think it's better to invite everyone to talk and think about them. So I thank you very much. Welcome to our last panel of the day. Um, and I'm really delighted to uh, introduce Emma Morena from the University of Glasgow, who is going to be giving a page to paper today entitled Cabinetes Monográficos, uh, Record Shops and Urban Space in Barcelona, 1898 to 1920. Thank you. Uh, so thanks very much, Tom and Samuel, for organizing this day and inviting me. And as with some of the papers that have been presented earlier, still pretty much work in progress, so I'll be grateful for any any feedback and so on for any sort of disjointed or incomplete uh, ideas that I've been presenting. Uh, so my paper today is part of a, a bigger research project that I'm uh, engaged in now, which concerns the beginnings of pornography in Spain, <coughs> approximately the 1880s to 1905, 1914, sometimes it's kind of a bit decided. So these are the research questions for the project, and as you can see, what I'm interested in is how uh, the reception of recording technologies in its early stages in Spain were influenced by local, national, regional culture and, and debates. Uh, so I'm interested in how <coughs> the rec recording technologies in Spain evolved in different ways compared to other countries, but I'm also interested in differences within Spain some of those differences might be uh, because of social class or, or, or gender, but in the case of this paper, it's about regional differences. Um, so, just so that you can understand what a cabinet de phonographico is, which you might not have come across the world before, I'll give you a brief chronology of the early decades of phonography in Spain. So, the thing for phonograph that you can see there is the oldest model of phonograph, and it was invented in 1877 and by Edison, of course, and it arrived in Spain a year later. Now, there were a few, a few demonstrations were organized, uh, but at this stage the phonograph was still quite, quite precarious, so it wasn't really suitable for uh, listening to music or even as a dictation machine, which was what Edison intended for it to, to, to be used as. So it was a sort of scientific curiosity, but it didn't have much relevance beyond a, you know, a few years after, after, after 1878. So in 1888, Edison launched the perfected phonograph that you consider, and this was uh, an improvement, of course, uh, with respect to the Tinfield phonograph. But it was still quite big, quite bulky, and quite difficult to operate, so it wasn't still suitable as a domestic uh, device. As, a machine for listening to music in your own home. So basically for about 10 years after that, so 1888 to the end, to the late 1890s, what the sort of interactions that most Spaniards would have with the phonograph would be um, when fanfare impresarios or scientific popularizers paraded these phonographs around and, and they demonstrated them in theaters or in clubs or in public values of, of any sort, normally for a fee, so it would have to pay, and of course it would be a sort of group uh, listening. And again, the, the appeal of those sessions was really to, to see for yourself that the phonograph was able to reproduce sound, so some musical pieces or some spoken um, pieces would be 
playback, but the interest was not so much in those specific pieces, but rather in reassuring yourself that the phonograph was able to, to reproduce sound as it was. And then finally, from 1896 to 98, I saw much three, three, three models of the phonograph that you can see at the bottom. And these three models and a couple others that he launched later on, this really opened the door for the phonograph to become a sort of domestic appliance. So this, this is really the start of people having phonographs in their homes and listening to musical recordings for, for aesthetic enjoyment, for, for their aesthetic value. Um, and so in Spain, it is the Gabinetes Phonográficos who are at the forefront of this initial uh, stage of domestic phonography. Uh, so, so this is the, um, the, the window of a Gabinete Phonográfico in, in Valencia. So Gabinetes Phonográficos were uh, establishments which sold phonographs and gramophones that they imported from abroad. And they also produced and sold um, recordings that they, they, they made themselves, mostly highly local singers. So at the time, most recordings were of vocal music, opera and zarzuela, and some flamenco as well, but not so much instrumental music. Uh, so I have managed to, to identify 40 gabinetes all over Spain, and all of them were very small operations. So one or two or three or four men, but they were quite small. And in many cases, they were also a sort of side activity to, not, to an existing business. So very, very often, an optician or a pharmaceutic or a, a manufacturer of scientific equipment or a clockmaker would come up with the idea of recording walk cylinders on the side and selling them in addition to their main activity. So this was all very, very precarious in a way. And most of the gabinets were, in fact, quite short-lived. So the first one to open. Uh, in 1896 was actually the, also the last, one, the last one to close in 1905, but most of them were much more shortly than that, sometimes just a few months or, or, or a few years. And from 1903, as I explained at, at the end of my paper, multinational companies start to take over and the government has come to an end, so such as uh, Gramophone, uh, Pathway, Odeon, so the names that you will be familiar with. Um, yeah, so just to give you an idea, so this is the, the window. This is the, the room where the walk cylinders were recorded. So you can see the piano there, and you can see a number of uh, diaphragms and other accessories that were used for recording. And this was, the, uh, this was a room where customers could listen to, to existing recordings and decide what they wanted to buy. Uh, so what I am interested in really is the role of the gabinetes in introducing domestic commercial phonography in Spain. And they did so in a way which was quite independent from Edison and his own company. So at the time, possibly because Spain was a relatively small market, Edison and his companies were not really that interested in, in establishing a presence there. Um, so I am referring here not, not only to introducing the products and the innovations that were coming from abroad, but what I'm most interested in is in how the gabinetes developed cultural concepts and cultural practices. So for example, they use the recording as a commodity that you buy for aesthetic or oral enjoyment of some sort, or the concept of listening uh, to music in your own home and on your own, uh, which is something that wouldn't have been possible before the current technologies appeared. So obviously these are all more global concepts and practices, but uh, the gabinetes shape them within national and local cultural specificities. Um, so I'll be talking about some of those later on. And in this, in this case, I am interested in how, uh, in why the gabinetes from Graficos in Barcelona were comparatively less successful than those in Madrid, so why why are there these big differences between two cities which you know, were quite similar in some respects. So what do I mean when I say that Barcelona gabinetes were less successful? So first of all, there were fewer gabinetes in Barcelona. So this is, this, are, this is a list of the gabinetes in Madrid. So 14 of them and nine in Barcelona. And most of them, except for two, they were just a few months, or operative for just a few months. Um, Barcelona also produced fewer recordings, or we can presume that they produced fewer recordings. Now, it's quite difficult to come up with 
uh, uh, an approximation to the number of recordings that have been produced and sold because these gabinetes were so precarious that there aren't any, any records really. But if we look at the recordings that have survived, even though it's a very small fraction of the recordings that were actually produced, so if you look at those surviving recordings at the Biblioteca Nacional de España, Biblioteca de Catalonia and so on, I've managed to count 53 recordings from Barcelona and 191 from Madrid. Um, so perhaps more importantly for the purposes of, of my research, there's also an important difference in the ability to attach cultural meanings to the new technological and commercial products that were being developed. Uh, and this is perhaps um, seen most clearly in the development of the recording as a commodity, as a concept, which happened in Madrid but not so much in Barcelona. So if you look at the first cabinet advertisements in Madrid from 1896 to 97, it's quite significant that they focused on the phonographs rather than on the recording. So they advertised specific models of phonograph, but the recordings were just made in passing. And my thinking is that obviously at this stage most potential customers would have experienced the phonograph in, in these group listening sessions. So they were the appeal of the, of the phonograph was to reassure yourself that it would reproduce reality as it was, but perhaps you wouldn't think of, oh, I'd li I really love this opera, I'd like to listen to this at home. So this is an idea that still needed to be developed. Um, nevertheless, after two or three years, we start seeing evidence that this new concept of the recording was starting to develop. So we start to see advertisements in the press which name specific singers, name specific uh, words that would have been recorded, so obviously at the time, the box cylinders could only hold like three minutes of music, so it would be an aria or uh, an opera from a zarzuela rather than a, a full opera or zarzuela. And the same can be said of the catalogs that the Madrid Caminetes started to launch in 1899-1900. So they are very much built around specific singers. So there are, this is from Ugencia Costa, which was like the biggest cabinet in Madrid. So specific singers with photographs, with the names of the, of the pieces that they, they sang, and also some biographical details, and there's also a hierarchy between singers, so some of them are more expressive than others, some of them do more recording than others. So uh, what this suggests to me is that um, Madrid's audiences were starting to develop these preferences, and, and they were starting to maybe ask for specific singers or specific pieces, rather than you know just you know, being fascinated by the ability of the photograph to reproduce reality as, as it was. However, in Barcelona, this doesn't happen to the same extent. So I have, I have only been able to find one example in which a gabinet names a singer specifically in one of its advertisements. So this is Rosselló, who was an optician, who also sold photographs on the side, and he mentions here, El Eminente Tenor Comis, which is really a by mistake, I've managed to find that the normal gomis with a G, not a gomis with a tenor, but uh, as I said, this is the only example. And um, quite significantly, the Barcelona cabinetes didn't release any catalogs, or I haven't been able to find any catalogs. Um, what is quite interesting as well is that some cabinetes did not even include the name of the singers in the singers themselves. So normally, as you can see, here, this is a Madrid cylinder. So it says Senor Biel, so a quite well known tenor, Marina, the name of the opera Salida, that was the name of the excerpt. But in, the, in this one, a phonographer from Barcelona, it just says name of the Zarzuela, Gigantes y Cabezudos, J, and that's, that's it. We don't know who was recording from, for, for them. And this is the case for all the, for all the cylinders by, from this gabinet that have survived. Um, and what this suggests to me is that the Barcelona gabinetes at the time, so around 1900, they still hadn't managed to acquire a clientele who would consistently buy recordings for their set value, who would develop a preference for a specific singer or, or a specific type of product. And then finally, another respect in which the Barcelona gabinetes were less successful than the Madrid ones is that they did not manage to consistently articulate a discourse around their products and identity which connected them to broader social concerns. So both the Madrid and the Valencia gabinetes had their own magazines 
So this is the Madrid one, and this is the Valencia one. Quite confusing, they share a name, but they were different operations, they were not connected. And it was especially the Madrid cabinet that managed to articulate um, a discourse through bulletin phonographico and also through interventions in the general press, letters to the editor and so on. So basically they presented themselves as a model as a model of the regeneracionista entrepreneur, so you know regeneracionismo at the end of the 19th century is this concern with the modernization, regeneration of Spain. So they presented themselves as these entrepreneurs who were very well versed in, in technological developments abroad and imported them uh, to contribute to the modernization and the development of the Spanish economy. So for example, the Madrid cabinet owners were very active in promoting all the accessories, all the improvements that they were making to the phonograph and the gramophone, showing that they were not just um, resellers of Edison's products, but they were inventors and scientists in their own right. And they were also very keen to showcase any collaborations with institutions such as the Teatro Real or, or the, sort of the various royals, they were gifting phonographs to royals all the time. But at the same time, they exhibited a critical attitude and they articulated criticisms to the government, normally complaining that the government was not doing enough to protect this nascent industry, which again is a quite common regenerationist concern of the time that the, the Spanish government wasn't doing much to help uh, entrepreneurs. However, this is not the case with the Barcelona industry. They didn't have a magazine, they didn't initiate debates in the same way as the Madrid one. So this comparative lack of success of Barcelona gabinetes is perhaps more difficult to explain uh, if we take into account that at the time Barcelona was in the middle of a decades-long transformation from provincial capital to Mediterranean metropolis. So basically from the 1860s to the 1920s Barcelona is undergoing these transformations. And of course science and technology play a key, a key role in both the physical transformation of the city. So for example the Universal Exhibition of 1888 and also in the cultural role that uh, Barcelona acquired as the capital of the city and Archulais Catalonia. So I would like to propose one potential explanation. Uh, there are a couple of other ideas that I have, and this has to do with the failure of the gabinetes to integrate themselves within the changing urban space of the city. So this is my attempt at mapping all the existing gabinetes of Barcelona. So of course they were active at different times, so they would have never existed under this form. But if any of you knows Barcelona, you will have probably noticed that they are all either on the Rambla itself, so this big boulevard, which was from Plaza de Catalunya to the sea, uh, or they were around, uh, not far away from, from the Rambla. Um, so La Rambla was the center of Barcelona for a number of centuries, but in the, 18, uh, in the late 1890s, uh, this was changing. So as you might know, from the 1860s, oh, sorry, uh, Barcelona starts this process of urban development, and basically urban development um, happens towards the north. So here are the gabinets again, you know, sort of safety, uh, bigger map. But basically all, all of Barcelona's development was happening towards the north, towards Gracia, and the so-called Aixamplos, you can see the, kind of the perfect square bit here, uh, dating from the late 19th century. Now this process took quite a long time, and it was driven by the bourgeoisie. So it was the bourgeoisie who started to build their own palaces, their own residences in the Aixamplos. And they were slowly, slowly leaving the historical center. <coughs> Now this, this was a quite long process, but uh, in the late 1890s the process was pretty much about to be completed. So it was not just the bourgeoisie lived in the Eixample, but their businesses were always were also moving there. The sort of commercial establishments they they went to were also moving there. The social spaces were also moving there. So this area where the gabinetes were based was getting more and more um, left behind in a way. And so my um, my thinking is that this didn't benefit the, the gabinets, of course, because the bourgeoisie would have been its natural client base. Of course, at that time, to, to buy a phonograph, a gramophone was quite expensive, so the bourgeoisie was its natural clientele, but they didn't manage to reach it uh, in the same way. 
Um, another reason, uh, another way in which Barcelona's urban configuration might have disadvantaged the gabinetes is uh, in the lo location of its theatres. Now, here I'd like to make a comparison with Madrid. Uh, so, this is a similar map for Madrid, and so these are, these are the gabinetes, and these are Zarzuela theatres. So, you might know that Zarzuela was an extremely popular entertainment in Madrid at the time, and in Barcelona as well, actually. And when I started making these maps, I was quite intrigued by the fact that several of the gabinetes were quite in close proximity to <coughs> Zarzuela theatres. And so, um, my thinking, my hypothesis is that um, they might have fed each other. So, in, in, in some cases, it is likely that opticians or pharmaceuticals would come up with the idea of recording cylinders because they saw theater goers coming and going. And so, what, what if these people were interested in buying a, a recording of this singer who is performing in this tafuela? So, so that's my that's my thinking from looking at the location of the gabinetes and also from looking at the ways in which people listen to recordings at that time. There's quite a lot of evidence that recordings work in in, in many cases as a sort of visual, uh, sorry, oral postcard, a sort of memento of the of the live music experience. So postcards, real postcards, were very popular at the time. And so my thinking is that recordings would have had a similar function at this time in Madrid. Now, what happened in Barcelona? Well, in Barcelona, as you might know, a lot of the Zarzuela theatres, light musical theatre uh, venues were in Avinguda del Paralel, which is this long street here, so quite far away from the gabinetes. You wouldn't walk past them on your way to the theatre, probably. Um, there's a sort of, there's something that I'm, I'm still kind of thinking about, which is the fact that there is a quite important theater near the gabinetes, which is the Teatro del Liceo, which is here. So this is in the middle of the Rambla, so in the middle of all these gabinetes. <coughs> but funnily enough, there aren't examples of the gabinetes trying to take advantage of this, uh, of this close proximity. So this the Liceo was not just the Opera Theater of Barcelona, but also a, a center of bourgeois sociability. Uh, but for example, the Teatro del Liceo was very active in promoting Wagner's operas, so it was like a center for Wagnerian performance. But funnily enough, no cylinders have survived with Wagner's music in, in them from the Barcelona gabinetes. So it's, I find it a bit strange that the gabinetes weren't capitalizing on that. The only, the only possible example of a gabinet trying to capitalize on, on that is this advertisement of Sociedad Artistico Phonographica. So they are, they, are, they are advertising. This is very uncommon because it's the only instance in which a Barcelona community says, we, we have recorded bits of these specific works. One of them is uh, Viva Kyrie, La Valkyria, Wagner, obviously. And the other one is La Bohème, which is also quite interesting because this, this ad is from eight, about April 1899. So uh, La Bohème was premiered at Eliseu the year before that. So it, is, um, it was very successful. So my thinking is that it is likely that this community was trying to exploit this connection, though I'm not sure if they were, if they were very successful. Um, so just to conclude, I would like to uh, talk very briefly about what happened to the gabinetes, uh, what, what happened to them. So in 1900 and 1902, Gramophone, so the, the recording company, visited Barcelona to record local artists. And in 1903, they opened their Spanish branch in Barcelona as well, which is quite interesting because obviously phonography was much more developed in Madrid, but Barcelona was more easily accessible from Europe, so my thinking is that that was the reason why. So at this point, there were only two gabinetes remaining active in Barcelona, and they both closed within one year. And Odeon, the French recording company, also opened a branch in Barcelona in 1906. Uh, so worldwide, what is happening really is that a few companies are, um, so they have an oligopoly on, on, on recording. So there are only four or five companies at any given time which bought smaller labels and they were kind of also merging with each other all the time, so it's a quite complex history. But this is really the end for smaller companies, smaller companies to be able to 
to make a living for themselves without being part of this big conglomerate. And another difference is that now the, the, it was the gramophone, not so much the phonograph, was the most popular device, and the gramophone records on discs, which are quite easy to, to duplicate, to mass produce. Uh, but still, these multinational companies needed to work closely with local, local performing cultures and local specificities. So some repertories, such as opera, would be marketed pretty much anywhere, but others, such as, for example, American marching bands or French cabaret, did not travel so easily. So what multinational companies did is that they recorded indigenous repertories, mostly for the local markets, but sometimes some of those local recordings could be marketed elsewhere. Uh, and this is what happened partly with uh, Sardana in Catalonia, so as you know, the popular uh, instrumental genre which is danced in a circle. So basically, um, Sardana was at this time starting to develop as, as a genre and also as a sort of Catalan national genre. It's quite interesting that the gabinet is never recorded any Sardana, at least we don't know that they did. But interestingly, Gramophone did on their first visit to Barcelona. They were quite attentive already to this local specificity. So it was this, it was a win band that they recorded, because you know that Sardana uses its own combination of instruments that they recorded that win band. Um, and at the same time, as I said, the, the gabinet is closed now. So whereas in Madrid, some of the gabinet is reconverted into multinational uh, agents. This wasn't the case in Barcelona, they all closed down, down. But they were replaced by a second wave of entrepreneurs, mostly uh, selling recordings, act, acting as agents of, of these multinational companies. And they also left their mark in this evolving regarding culture in, in, in some ways. So it's not as if they were just acting as representatives of these multinationals, they, they also shaped uh, local culture in, in, in many ways. So I'm just going to give you an example to conclude, which is uh, um, a so-called gramophone factory. So there were, there, there were a few places in Barcelona in the 1910s, 1920s, which presented themselves as gramophone factories, but they really weren't. So they imported the mechanisms from abroad, and what they really did was just the form and the wooden base. Um, but this, mm, these bits, so the wooden base and the form, sometimes provided opportunities for them to, to express a sort of national or local identity. This is the case with this one. So the company is built in Ipuch, in Barcelona, so active in the 1910s, 1920s. This is a really big phone, like the grand phone, the Museo de la Musica in Barcelona. And you probably cannot see what, what is here. So they, they, they built this bit and they decorated it. But I'll show you in the next photograph. <laughs> so this is a, a, a Catalan pagé, so the typical Catalan dress and dress with a valentina, so the stereotypical Catalan hat. So thanks very much. I keep struggling with the times for us, I struggle with the paper itself, so any, any feedback will be much welcome. Um, so this paper discusses whether, by considering the encounter between choral performance and political activism as lobbies, it is possible to account more fully for the effective power and transformative capabilities of choral singing. It is argued in this paper that performances by the Orfeo Socialista, in early 20th century Madrid, challenged the sound noise binary that structured the politics of sound hiding in that context. Moreover, these performances, as they created and appropriated acoustic territories in the city, counter the prevalence of discourse in the making of political identities in Madrid. Madrid's Orfeo Socialista was neither the first nor the only one of its kind in Spain. The physical and social transformation of the city, however, 
complicated the scenario of sound activity in way, ways that might reveal unique aspects of chorality's social transformative powers. The rise of the middle classes in Madrid was consolidated through the building of the Ensante, so the equivalent of the Ensante that Eva was talking about, from the 1860s on. Middle class comfort and hygiene developed in parallel with oral hygiene, which was used as a technology of power and social control. And I'll explain. As I have argued elsewhere, in the 19th century city, social control depended on strategies of territorialization that challenged the prevalence of the visual and were dependent on psychological and legal, and legal sorry, mechanisms developed in reaction to stench and noise. Listening in the city was to a certain extent a mechanism of mutual surveillance. I'm thinking about Atali here. And relied on a contingent distinction between sound and noise. This distinction led to the production of moral and social orthodoxies and through them to the rise of forms of social exclusion and marginality. Altogether, this politics of sound hygiene produced an urban landscape of social segregation. In my analysis of the Orfeo Socialista, I take up Mary Thompson's invitation to move beyond the aesthetic moralism that underpins the distinction between music and noise, and to embrace noise as a productive, transform transformative force relation and a necessary component of material relations. Performances by the Orpheum can be conceptualized as noise, first because socialism and anarchism were regarded as a socially disruptive force that challenged the prevalent pol political, social and economic order, and second, because these performances contained cries, shouts, and cheers that, did, that dislodged music from the center of sound production. Key in the central music was the fact that socialist choirs, in the Madrid one in particular, were formed by amateur singing workers. Their music was not an aesthetic or intellectual product, or not seen as such, or not heard as such, but a vocal artifact that demanded emotional engagement. Noise did not interfere with the music, but enhanced its vocality. The working together of noise and unison singing erodes difference and flattens out social hierarchy as it cancels the tensions between consonants and dissonance, both in tonal and metaphorical terms, and brings under question the binary notes in noise music. The Orpheum's choral performance thus responded to perceptions that socialism was socially dissonant with a form of orality that rendered a dualism consonance dissonance meaningless or even imperceptible. As it strove to create a symbolic space of legitimacy, the Orpheum Socialista exploited the materiality and affective qualities of noise to advance Socialism, socialism's ideals of justice and equality. Analysis of its performances raises questions as to whether it is possible to speak of a utopian soundscape in which ideals are resounded by the singing voice and the bodies of workers. The Orpheum, as it blurred the boundary between singer and listener, created the illusion that social change involved everyone and left no victims. The Orpheon transported the experiencing of social utopia beyond the cognitive, cognitive, cognitive level of mini production and into the precognitive world of affect. Thus, choral singing was able to rescue socialism from the contingency of language and the politics of this force that the media and political parties exploited to protect and advance certain values and ideologies. The activity of the Orpheum Socialista translated into acoustic sensitivities, emotions that ran through the social body and were being shaped and reconfigured through discourse. Yet, while trying to remove those emotions from the public sphere and the effect of discourse, the Orpheum's performances were framed by discursive formations such as rallies, speeches, and media coverage that signal the temporality and contingency of utopia. The Orpheum's success thus depended on its capacity to navigate the discursive, symbolic, and affective spaces in which its performances echo, and ironically to control its political resonance while aiming to maximize its acoustic impact. 
the Orfeon Socialista, created in 1900, played a key role in shaping public perceptions of socialism in Madrid through its public performances. Up to the 1890s, choral societies were an instrument for moral indoctrination, control, and demobilization of workers. They aimed to provide workers with a space of sociability that was surveyed according to middle class moral standards. Choral societies were born as an alternative to the tavern, where it was believed that workers squandered their middle salaries, based themselves morally, and most alarmingly exchanged revolutionary ideas. So if you read things like El Libro del Obrero, that's the kind of philosophy or conception of the work that you can find. It. So since the foundation of the Orfeón Socialista de Bilbao in 1893, and followed by its Madrid counterpart in 1900, however, choral societies started to be regarded as a socially disruptive force. Although choirs are perceived by many as embodiments of social harmony, their internal cohesion may be used against forces and ideologies outside of them. The Orfeo Socialista in Madrid, while inheriting some of the disciplinary codes of early acquired choirs, presented a more radical facade to society. Their performances punctuated socialist rallies, rallies that gathered masses of between 8,000 to 30,000 militants, reported. Seeking unison and the absence of polyphony and complexity of any kind of socialist anthems called for massive participation. So, anthems such as La Internacional, Proletarios Unidos, Los Hijos del Trabajo, or El Primero de Mayo, were cheered by applauses, which often became boisterous and prolonged. Unquote. According to socialist publications, performances of these anthems were often uproariously applauded or received with enthusiastic cheers, or even given an enthusiastically an enthusiastic ovation. So, these are quotations. These sounds were not ancillary, but were integral elements of the performance and had a double purpose. On the one hand, they amplified the sound, helping it reach out to a wider audience. On the other hand, they aimed to deepen the militant's commitment by stirring extreme emotions, such as a reported raving enthusiasm. Their perceived status as sound or noise depended on how much they were felt to interfere with the musical performance. The goal of performance, however, was not to produce beauty, but to overwhelm and unite. To distinguish between music and noise in this particular context is unproductive, and is equivalent to analyzing social practice through the prism of the absolute music paradigm. This that distinction produces a sound orthodoxy that is in turn the extension of unequal social structures. One of the first performances of the Orfeón Socialista in Madrid took place during the celebrations of the 1st of May in 1900. In the presence of 7,000 attendants, attendants gathered at the Fronton Central. The meeting kicked off with a speech that justified its location in doors on the grounds that, quote, the government is concerned about administrations in the public space. In fact, in anticipation of any incidents, continuation of the quote, the authorities have taken precautions and placed police and civil guard corps on different locations. Socialist meetings were likely to raise the fear of the authorities. According to Robles de Gea, public debates and propaganda acts in restoration of Spain often led to quote, demonstrations that aim to occupy public spaces as a means to apply political pressure and that were characterized by a great emotional tension. Quote. Most meetings were reportedly peaceful, but speakers occasionally used words that could be interpreted as calls for social upheaval. In order to avoid being surveyed, most of these meetings took place in doors, often inside a theater in Madrid, although a government delegate would attend occasionally. These meetings thus generated an urban cartography of socialism and now it goes to the atomized, discontinuous production of space that, according to Williams, is characteristic of anarchism. By the time the new headquarters of socialism in Spain, otherwise known as the Casa del Pueblo de Madrid, were founded in 1908, the Orfeón Socialista had mostly performed indoors only. The number of socialist militants in Madrid had risen dramatically, but socialists had still to conquer the public space. The Orfeón helped to pursue this goal by, by using the resounding voice as an instrument of acoustic territorialization. 
but its presence in public had to be legitimized in the eyes of the authorities. One of the ways to achieve this was to cut against the prevalent politics of sound hygiene through which links between marginal social modalities and polluting sound practices were established by media, leading to the production of oppressive moral and political orthodoxies. It was crucial that your film's performances managed to break the association between musical practices endorsed by the middle classes, such as brass bands and bourgeois choirs, and the notion of an aural hygiene. Another way was to break away with the dominant view that popular and street music, such as organ grinders and flamenco, were a form of acoustic pollution. Socialist journals such as the Socialista and La Lucha de Clases used their pages to achieve these goals. In so doing, however, they reinforced your film's dependence on this force to make its goals succeed in the public sphere. This dependence questions the, question the autonomy of sound and reality convey, to convey emotions that could help realize the socialist utopia. The Socialista described the Casa del Pueblo as a hygienic and merry palace of laborers that contrasted with the gloomy and ancient stately mansions where the Casa was established. The journal La Escuela Moderna, founded by Francisco Ferrer, the anarchist whose death penalty sentence led to the Semana Trágica in Barcelona, praised, quote, the cleanliness, sightness, and neatness found even in the smallest details of the new building. Quote, the casting of their film's performances as hygiene was done more subtly and obliquely, putting them, pitting them against musical practices deemed polluting. So the journal El Socialista, their film's most vocal advocate, published a moralistic article in 1915 that scorned the carnival as a moment of plebeian merriment in which people get intoxicated by the noise of their roaring laughter. End of quote. The author of this article, Cesar González, dismissed, quote, all that customary street parting that is swung by the shrilling notes of the grand organ, end of quote. This criticism resonates with an article published 10 years earlier in Nuevo Mundo that welcomed public performances by workhouse bands as a means to, quote, defeat that repugnant instrument called organillo, that is the bar of piano. The organillo, this article continued, is responsible that, quote, the common woman gives herself up to the luscious promiscuity of her pandering walls. <laughs> that's, my, that's my translation, so um, take it with me. And, uh, the similarity between the two articles is not just rhetorical. Both of them establish a moral hierarchy of musical practices in which organ binders feature at the bottom. El Socialista, thus, so the journal, thus cast organ grinders as a polluting, polluting musical practice that was subordinated to the more hygienic music of the Orfeón Socialista. Socialist meetings and performances by the Orfeón could challenge the politics of silencing promoted by authorities and the mainstream media. It was necessary that their film convey their message or its message in a silent way that did not run counter to the authorities' goal of spreading oral hygiene, oral hygiene. Again, the socialist and liberal media were instrumental in giving shape to this perception. Newspaper El Heraldo de Madrid described the inauguration of the Casa del Pueblo de Madrid in 1908, in which 30,000 workers participated, as quote a serious and dignified act of the proletariat that was carried out through pacific means with no cry, no shout being heard. This testimony contrasts with the reported noisiness of the Orpheum's performances. Socialist media introduced complexity into this narrative, preferring instead to cast the Orpheum's the Orpheum's side revolution, that's my wording, as the product of a militant fight. The inauguration of the Casa del Pueblo in 1908 was celebrated by El Socialista, the journal, as the product of, quote, a silent labor because everything that sounds loud is hollow, end quote. The noisy ones are, quote, the politicians who have done little more than insult and scorn us from within the shell of their ignorance, end of quote. The foundation of the Casa del Pueblo, however, was described by the same journal as the victory, quote, of a powerful army of 
30,000 soldiers who have today taken by storm the old Duque de Frias Palace where Casa was established, end quote, an act that many celebrated as a symbolic victory of equality over privilege. The fight does not end with this symbolic conquest, as a few days later, quote, a crowd of workers will invade eccentric streets on their way to the palace, that is, the Casa del Pueblo, towards which they will march with their flags, with the flags of their regional associations. Another article described the Casa del Pueblo as not just a precious stronghold, but a bright beacon that will bring about the definitive triumph of our fair cause, casting its rays over all our comrades in all corners of Spain, end of quote. The purpose of a rhetoric that is martial, yet endorses silence, is to confound, overwhelm, and command respect. A silent revolution subverts the associations established by Mary Schaefer between silence and authority. It breaks up the precedence between noise pollution and sound practices associated with social disorder and marginality. In that way, the style of revolution creates a space of legitimacy for those practices. The contradiction inherent in the style of revolution, in that word, is also present in socialism, which has, since its inception, um, debated about whether violence is a necessary step towards achieving peace. But that ambivalence is perhaps best embodied by socialist anthems. Musicologists and, sorry, musicologist and socialist sympathizer Jose Sugiram um, argued in 1932 that socialist anthems, quote, can put up in arms phalanxes that anxiously await the much deserved improvement of individual and collective living conditions, end of quote. Yet many anthems convey pacifist messages in their lyrics. Socialist leader in Galicia Prieto witnessed firsthand at a barber shop in Bilbao the creation of the Marsellesa de la Paz, whose lyrics contain a message of peace that is superimposed on the original warlike 1792 uh, song by um, Roger de Lille. So I think what happened with Marsellesa de la Paz is that they took the original music of the Marseillaise and they replaced the lyrics with, um, with um, Spanish lyrics talking about peace. And, and socialist revolution. Recalling the creation of this anthem in Alicio Prieto, uh, described how, in his memoirs, quote, an essentially bellicose anthem was transformed into a hopeful and peaceful song, unquote. Yet silence and peace are not equivalent, and the extent to which performances by the old film met the goals of a silent revolution can only be fully assessed by examining social responses, which are limited. Socialist periodicals voice views that were clearly different from those of the mainstream media, but it is not clear whether they capture the full complexity of social response. Socialist journals did not resolve the tension between the hygienic and noisy qualities they ascribed to the film's performances. The reluctance of socialist journals to address this question suggests that not only did they notice this noise, but that they embraced it as a socially transformative and productive force. The association made by the mainstream media and the authorities between silence, authority, and peace produced monologic and derogatory conceptions of noise. By subverting this relationship, the film arguably avoided exposing socialist activist, activism to persecution. More importantly, perhaps this subversion was also a means to avoid that the film's militant audience be reduced to an anonymous and homogeneous multitude and to reconfigure them as a collective. Only by breaking up the aforementioned association could the Orfeon avoid subsiding uh, to the background, fading into the cacophony of the city, where their political message could be lost, or would be lost, and established, sorry, <laughs> and their identity diluted. This may explain why they mostly relied on indoor performances in their early days. Engaging with the audience through collective singing and choreography help them to blur the boundary between audience and performance, performers. Choir members were thus reconfigured as a meaningful collective, which, to paraphrase Stephen Connor, endowed the fantasy of their collectivity with a bodily substance, thus creating a unified hyperbole. 
This may be the reason why they cancelled performances where they felt that engagement with their whole audience could be jeopardized. So they did at a widely attended outdoor meeting in 1905, where they felt they would not be heard by all attendants. We want everyone to hear us. Since that. Since that is not possible, we are leaving, they reportedly declared. Division made them weaker and more, and more vulnerable. Socialism used choral performance and sound to raise self-awareness, stimulate cohesion, and negotiate its presence in the public sphere. As it expands, sound appropriates and re-semanticizes space and becomes a space too. Social practice always occurs in a space that is reconfigured by sound. Socialism used the film to negotiate its oral presence in the brain. The challenging use of noise in choral performance helped to complicate and blur the music noise divide underpinning sound orthodoxies, and in that way, to challenge the politics of silence in prevalent in Madrid's oral regime. Noise in performance generated a participatory atmosphere through which choral singing transcended the role of a collective expression to become the making of a utopian collective. Thanks very much. So, <clears throat> our last paper of today um, is uh, entitled Madrid's Soundscape and the Fall of the Commune, uh, which will be given by uh, Ian Biddle from Newcastle University. Excellent. Well, thank you all for staying the course. Um, so, so, please forgive me, I'm going to be reading my paper from a laptop. You shouldn't draw any conclusions about when I finish writing it and that whatsoever. <laughs> sounding modern? The question is deliberately capricious, open-ended and ambiguous. In this presentation, I want to explore some of the ways in which the Madrid soundscape, soundscape changed in the 19th century, and to theorize some of the other ways in which new or <coughs> cultures of the city affected sociability, the experience of living in the city, and imaginations of the urban commons. A number of key developments made in the middle of the 19th century changed the conditions under which sounds were produced and propagated in Madrid. These include so-called urban repairs, which was a euphemism for radical transformation of various areas, the so-called uh, uh, crypto um, housemanization uh, process, the widening of thoroughfares and the removal of overhangs, corbel constructions and awnings. Are you familiar with the term a corbel? Apparently, I don't know this till I wrote this paper. A corbel is a, uh, uh, something that juts out of the building uh, and, it, and it juts out on, on two sides of the street to enable some kind of cover to be put over there temporarily. Okay. So cool buildings are buildings that have little things sticking out. The process led slowly to changes in what was heard to a rise in overall average intens intensities, um, in, in, uh, a rise in lower frequencies and in continuous noises. From 1823, with successive additions to street bylaws, the Madrid authorities banned various devices that absorbed and dispersed sound and inadvertently established a new kind of street acoustics which might be termed lo-fi, borrowing uh, somewhat critically admittedly from Alma Rishay's terminology. Several bylaws banned dyers, drapers, cleaners, and so on from setting up poles and hanging out fabric. Such drapes were only permitted if they were located at least six meters above the ground, they did not jut out more than 80 centimeters into the street. Indeed, encorbled additions were also banned, and existing elements were gradually demolished as structures were rebuilt and repaired. Under Article 3 of a police bylaw issued on the 9th of December 1823, awnings were only allowed on squares and never in the streets. Cafes were only allowed to set up chairs and benches in squares on condition that they did not encroach on public thoroughfares by more than 1.5 meters. Elsewhere, placing chairs outside cafes was strictly forbidden. So much for the legalistic framework of changing uh, uh, um, acoustic logics of the city. I'm going to leap forward from that 
very important moment in the uh, 1820s to 1871. And hopefully that, that leaping will become clear why I'm doing that. For the moderns, it would seem, simply to read on a tram is to experience the full richness of modernity's cacophonous over confusion. The introduction of the omnibus in Paris, London, and other cities gave rise to a vast body of cultural representations, both images and texts that probed the unique social experience of public transport. These expressions took many forms, including stories, songs, plays, novels, and panoramic, panoramic literature. Quite a late example is Dobby Bergelson's 1909 short Yiddish language novella, Arun Boxal, a depot, which explores a new and transient community of tram travelers by mimicking the cadence of their voices, aping the linguistic habits of each group, represented flatly without hierarchy. So we can see um, various attempts at reconfiguring the city. One of the key moments in the new acoustic ecology of the city is the development of public transport. Very early on, um, in 1837, Honoré Domer, in his collection of uh, um, sketches called the Tite Parisienne, um, uh, <coughs> developed this uh, 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 produces an interesting uh, impression of an interieur d'un omnibus. It constructs the interior of the tram as a site of unwelcome and random intimacy. In addition, we might also think of Leo Tolstoy's Kreutzer Sonata, which, although not set on a tram, is set on a train and deals with very similar kinds of acoustic questions about being in this wooden box with these people that you've never met before and how can you stand to be there for any longer. One of the earliest examples of this new transport literature, as I'm calling it, is Benito Pérez Calgos' early novella, La Novela in el Tranvía of 1871. Now, what's extraordinary about that novella is that it is written exactly the same year as the tram was introduced in Madrid. Um, and indeed, Madrid had no public transport to speak of until 1871. So, as uh, um, Adolfo Foresta noted in 1877, with consternation, Madrid is this weird place where they simply um, leapt from nothing to the, 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 the apotheosis of, of, of public transport, which is the tram, without any you know, mediation at all. He has the following to say, Cosa singular. En Madrid no exista ni han existado nunca ómnibus para el servicio de la ciudad y se ha pasado directamente de la ausencia absoluta de estos medios de transporte tan populares y baratos a la última forma de los mismos, es decir, al tranvía. So, Galdós's novela explores the relationship between the interior space of the tram and the inner world of the narrator. It also explores the, for Madrid, now new auditory world of the tram by sketching several dichotomies. First one, popular one that, that keeps kind of being reread into this novella, particularly by Spanish commentators, is the, the juxtaposition of interior and exterior sound spaces. And uh, 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 going on from that is also this development of fascination for um, um, large and small worlds. I should just say here, these are very early examples. The, the, the first trams were actually pulled by mules, and um, so they were very slow, and they only serviced the most expensive uh, you know, bourgeois areas of Madrid. So these are not the democratizing uh, moments that we might think of in Paris or in London, for example. So we have these two dichotomies, the interior and the exterior, the small and the large, but also um, uh, what's really strange in this novella is there are these moments where um, uh, Galdós switches the sound off. He stops talking about sound and we, we enter into an interior world of the box itself, where the only thing, that, the only sounds that we hear are what's going on inside. The city disappears altogether. Um, and what's really interesting is this fourth dichotomy that he emerges here is the dichotomy of um, the, the tram as legible, as a place we can make sense of because there are these different social groups mingling with each other, to the tram as a site of complete you know, uh, 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 confusion. I don't know what to make of these completely random uh, encounters. So there we have these uh, uh, dichotomies that, that Galdós deals with. 
So this is a space in which boundaries between the public and the private, between self and other, are constantly violated. The opening of the work reveals that the narrator, who is actually also on the tram himself, um, despite the recent introduction of the tram in Madrid, is no novice to public transportation. So we are expected to identify with him as a cosmopolitan. <clears throat> to assure himself a seat, he bypasses the queue, grabbing onto the bar that supports the staircase to the Imperiale, which is the upper level, which is a bit more expensive, therefore also uh, uh, deliberately talking, you know, hierarchizing in, in the novel different kinds of social order. Um, in the process, he bumps into a fellow passenger. Um, I know, I just lost my place. Okay. Sorry, I just went back one page for some reason. Yeah. Uh, in the process, he bumps into a fellow passenger, uh, Don Dionisio Cascajares de la Valina, a very uh, funny name. Um, obviously, that loss is human there. Um, or who enters from the other side and who in turn collides with an English woman behind him, knocking her straw bonnet with his cane. The opening of the story thus draws attention to the awkward proximity of omnibus travel. In this first section of the story, then, the narrator experiences the omnibus as a small world and experiences it with the sound on, so to speak. He runs into an acquaintance um, who speaks of an unnamed countess, assuming that the narrator knows her. After Dionysio leaves, however, the narrator begins to see the tram as a space of awkward proximity with strangers, an arbitrary slice of an alienatingly large world. The emphasis now lies on the randomness, heterogeneity, or juxtapositions of the tram, the metonymies of the urban space, if you like. This shifting from metonymy to metaphor is key to understanding the acoustic logics of the tram. As the narrator puts it, al entrar ya encontramos a alguien Otras vienen después que estamos ahí. Unos se marchan, quedándonos nosotros. Y por último también nos vamos. Imitación es esto de la vida humana, en que el nacer y el morir, morir uh, son como las entradas y salidas. ¿A qué me, me refiero? So this idea of the tram being the whole world, the whole life. There's nothing but the tram. You come in, you're alive, you leave, you're dead. Um, and that's a really interesting kind of uh, uh, metaphor that it uses here. As the narrator begins to project an image of meaning onto the tram, he moves away from the vision of the vehicle as a random slice of a large and infinitely diverse world, and he talks about the idea of a mundo pequeño. Y para que la uh, uh, semejanza sea más completa, también hay un mundo chico de pasiones en miniatura dentro de aquel cajón, in that box. Yeah. Muchos van ahí que se nos antojan excelentes personas y nos agrada su aspecto y hasta les vemos salir con disgusto. Otros, por el contrario, nos revientan desde uh, que les echamos la vista encima, les aborrecemos durante 10 minutos. Examinamos con cierto rencor sus caracteres fredológicos y sentimos verdadero gozo a verles salir. So, what this novella helps us to think about is the acoustic order of Madrid in the 19th century and changes to that acoustic order. It helps us understand something of the auditory experience of the city of Madrid in the second half of the 19th century, but it does not allow us to access the sonic world of 19th century Madrid as such. This is always a problem for anyone who works on historical sound studies, particularly in the pre-phonographic era. I've already mentioned the acoustic changes imposed on the city by various city ordinances, ordinances in the first half of the century. The removal of encobbled protuberances, for example, the forbidding of awnings, washing, rand drying, and chairs in narrow streets, and the new emphasis on the functional meaning of the street as a channel through which the vain people. The introduction of the tram to Madrid in 1871 intensified this utilitarian logic, and the need for clear ordinances about street adornment became ever more pressing. In 1874, Madrid authorities renewed the 1823 ordinances and included also the requirement that ex external window adornments um, be almost flush within the building facade, no more than two centimeters out from the, the original building. So you can see that there's clearly something going on in the local legal discourse about sound, noise, and ownership of public spaces. 
from 1879, the mule pole trams were replaced by steam, and then in 1899, they were replaced by electric trams. So different uh, kinds of acoustic orders and worlds were introduced by each of those transformations. Each technological change brought with it acoustic masking effects that had profound consequences for the auditory experience of the city. And of course, with each change, the tram became more and more ubiquitous until the beginning of the 20th century, almost all areas were served by some kind of public transport network, usually uh, trams, but also some other kinds of, of, of buses. It is impossible then to appreciate the full extent of the sound consequences of the urban and architectural morphology without some understanding of the intensity of the sounds and noises being reflected. Unfortunately, we have no idea of the level of sound in the streets during the period we are studying, nor do we have any way of comparing the acoustic measurements we can carry out now with other more um, remote observations. And please, this is where I geek out a bit. I actually took some acoustic recordings of Madrid as quiet as I could get it in various spaces that I knew were key sites for new forms of transportation. There was standing at 4 a.m. And anyone who's ever been to Madrid knows that it's a hopeless idea trying to find a quiet moment in Madrid to do anything, but 4 a.m. on a Sunday uh, morning was as good a time as ever when you get it. So, you'd be pleased to know that I observed um, uh, uh, decibel uh, ranges from 46.5 to 56.5 in the streets of Madrid, particularly around Puerto del Sol. A comparable study carried out at the end of the first third of the 20th century shows that car horns and peace whistles reach at the level, uh, at the highest of 84.5 decibels, quite loud and quite disturbing and, and damaging for your ears if, you, if you're exposed to those kind of that noises constantly. So the noise at certain times and places can become continuous in that kind of new uh, early 20th century auditory experience. The level of sound is commonplace in the centre of Madrid, but we have no comparable information for the 19th century, obviously. All we know is that measurements of the average noise taken on the spot in summer of um, 2006, when I made those first recordings, reveal an acoustic level that is practically equivalent to the level of Madrid in 1935, which is around 61 to 62 decibels. Okay. Consequently, to complete, if complete is indeed the right word, maybe to open up a historical sound study of 19th century Madrid, we're going to have to use Jean-Francois Ouellard and Henri Tog's sound effect concept. It's currently employed, uh, as you know, by these researchers at Cresson, a very interesting research group uh, based in Lyon, and one of the members of that group, um, Olivier um, Ballet, did a chapter in a book I edited a couple of years ago on. Uh, historical sound studies on um, the sound studies in Lyon in the 19th century. So some of the variants of such sound effects can be used for a backward-looking analysis of the sound consequences of urban redevelopment in the 19th century, and for a plausible description of the almost striking differences in the quality of sounds between the urban fabric of what we might laughingly call the Ancien Régime and its neo-Hausmannian -Hausman counterpart. In terms of quality and quantity, sound effects enable us, or rather the methodology of sound effects thinking, enables us to um, approximate the past properties of the street to gain a better understanding of how city dwellers of the past heard their neighborhood. Now, one of the things I deliberately did in this paper is to set myself, because you know we live in austere times, so why not, um, to set myself the challenge of not talking about music once. So I'm aware that music is absent from this paper completely, maybe that's something we can bring in in questions. Um, so I'm, I'm really trying to think about, you know, removing that whole musical agency for the moment and thinking about the city as a, as a space that is negotiable through sound. So here we have Tal and Obeya's sound effects taxonomy, at least the bits that I find useful here. Um, are you familiar with this book? It's really useful. The, the basic idea is that there are there's a taxonomy of different kinds of sounds, and that these sounds um, can be attached to different kinds of ways of uh, living. So, cities, uh, large cities, small towns, etc. And, and there are, there are uh, th these different sound effects uh, mix in different ways to give you qualities and textures, ways of describing um, you know soundscapes much larger than simply you know, momentary, auditory uh, experiences. So, the, the three issues that are, actually the four that I want to talk about here is the cutting sound effect. 
Um, in practical terms, the cutting sound effect corresponds to a sudden drop in intensity associated with an abrupt change in the spectral envelope or the reverberation of noise. So something has just either masked something or something is just suddenly cut out for some reason. It could be a building is masked or another noise uh, um, has got in the way so that your, your attention may be drawn to one sound, so that sound is cut by something else. So the cutting sound effect perceived when moving from a junction into a street, as discussed above, did not disappear altogether in the streets laid out in the 19th century, but it was less pronounced than in the 18th century streets. And I think it's a very clear point to make that wide boulevards have a very different acoustic um, uh, feeling than the narrow ones, because there's m more air. Uh, and sound escapes in a, in a different kind of way. So sounds don't linger in the same way that they do in narrow streets. So um, lower frequencies take advantage of the opening out onto the injunction to enter the street. So you get a change in the prevalence of different kinds of frequencies depending on what kind of street you're on. So the cutting effect is pushed back um, up the street, becoming less noticeable, above all when combined with the change in the perception of local social life mentioned above. As soon as one entered an 18th century street, for example, this effect produced a more favorable sense of the emerging sound of the daily life of the street. Moving into a larger street, what you get is a sudden, radical shift in auditory quality. And so what house housemanization does, in a sense, is give you this experience of shifting between very wide and narrow streets, which is a, 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 an interesting sound effect using this terminology, not itself. Um, there is a masking sound effect. Um, in Madrid, some masking, um, sound masking took two main forms in the 19th century. Either a more powerful sound masked another one, or a building interposed itself between the subject and the source of the sound. As one enters a street moving away from a junction, the intensity of the sound of the crowd or traffic from the junction, so-called ambient noise, diminishes in proportion to the width of the street. The greater the masking effect, the less passerby can differentiate sounds localize their source and gauge their distance. When the ambient noise is relatively low, the occupant of a dwelling can hear sounds close to, but also remote emergent sounds. If the ambient noise is louder, that, uh, that is no longer possible. So you get this experience of acoustic shrinking, the acoustic enlarging, depending on the level of ambient noise outside. Um, reverberation sound effects is a very important um, acoustic uh, uh, ingredient in the 19th century city um, in a narrow street is an essential part of how the neighborhood is perceived sonically. In the broader streets of the second half of the 19th century, reverberation did not last so long, and human sounds are much less noticeable. So these large avenues actually uh, remove the oral evidence of the human, in a way, or at least to tone, tone, tone that down. This is enough to completely alter one's perception of the environment and neighborhood and sociability more broadly. And of course, finally, it is particularly mixing sound effects. It is the existence of more than one sound effect simultaneously and how they mix, which gives us the very peculiar, specific, local experience of what it's like to be in a city. So it refers to the joint penetration of simultaneous neighboring sources. For the mixing sound effect to occur, the various sounds need to be at similar levels of intensity. This effect is primarily found in transition areas, likely to receive sound atmospheres from different places. It is of particular relevance to the circular nature of sound between the inside of dwellings and the street. It's quite clear, for example, that the perception of sound in a narrow street may be at one and the same time stable and dynamic. It is stable because the, circul the circularity of sounds between the inside and outside is constant, or because the circularity lasts or repeats itself for long enough to be perceived as such. Sorry, I'm really geeking out here, I know this, but hopefully there is something you can draw out of this that would be helpful. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware of time is pressing, so I'm just going to move forward through that. I've got a whole bunch more of this geeky stuff, which I'm just going to edit out, and hopefully we'll come back to uh, a little bit later on. As we can see then, the 19th century urban model produce, produces its particular forms of audition, auditory perception, and the various ways of making space sound differ with variations in morphology. Actually, I'll just read that again, because I didn't do that very well. Auditory perception and the various ways of making space sound differ with variations in morphology. In other words, the, the way which the city is developed. The nature of sound exchanges between the street and dwellings and the forms of appropriation are transformed. The shape and dimensions of streets and the relative smoothness of facades 
contribute to differentiating the conditions under which ambient sound propagates or lasts or doesn't. In an attempt to reconstruct the way one would have, and again, the history has disappeared, the way one would have heard sounds in 19th century Madrid, this approximation of the ways in which individual citizens perceive sounds depending on the space and their social presence, in their home and in the street, is an inaugurable and still far from complete step, I admit that. It shows how the urban sound atmosphere, a concept of the sense of comfort, has evolved. In a more open spatial morphology, human voices are diluted. The presence of local social life is almost inaudible. Neighborhood relations are transformed and the perception of a background noise made up of city activities, to which various means of transport, such as the tram, have been added, becomes dominant, increasing the sense of a sound intrusion. Lastly, for city dwellers walking in the street, there is less contrast in urban acoustics, save an emphasis on contrast itself. So one of the things we can say about the 19th century uh, soundscape, particularly in this late pre-phonographic moment, is that we have a dominance of cutting and mixing effects, that there are shifts in public transport technology which affect the, the sonic uh, experience of the street and one's ability to negotiate it. Um, the new experiences of auditory thresholds, so new ways of, of moving from one auditory uh, characteristic to another. And one of the things we might say is that modernity itself emerges as a, as a, as a kind of um, a mixing sound effect uh, or, a, or a logic of the mixing sound effect. So by way of inclusion then, this leaves us with some questions, and I know I've not answered many or any of these, but um, hopefully in the, in the, in, within the logic of the workshop, hopefully this will generate some conversation. Um, so this leaves us with some questions, not all of which I'm able to answer here. Perhaps the most pressing question, however, is how these new audibilities, these new auditions and auditory regimes, shape new forms of sociability. One way of thinking this is to draw on Samuel's idea of oral hygiene, which I really like, I find that very productive. Uh, another way is to look at Foucault and ideas of power and have sound and power are organized. Um, but one way to think this is through the notion of the commune, as propounded by Antonio Negri. For him, a commune is a construct of the new politics of the modern. It is a coagulation without coherent ideological cause, an assemblage that is fragile, transient, and more importantly for us here, it is an imaginary without a coherent imagined object. This objectless politics is symptomatic of what Negri and Hart have called multitude, which also resonates with Samuel's paper, works in line with the theorization of shared spaces, of communal common grounds of publicly owned and publicly organized spaces. In a sense, then, the new auditory regime of the modern city, inaugurated in Madrid only after 1871, is also the fall of one particular kind of commune, and its displacement by what I have called elsewhere the auditory commons. As Negri makes clear, the commons is under attack by the constant colonization of the city by capital. In 1871, trams in Madrid were privately run and connected only the wealthiest areas of the city. In this sense, then, the auditory regime of mid-industrial modernity is also an invasion of the auditory regimes of older commons by auditory regimes of the new capital. This works as a kind of insidious traumatic colonization, flattening and monetarizing human sociability, but re-hierarchizing it in new forms. This is the first of many falls, the fall of the commons, the fall of older forms of sociability, as attested by uh, in Galdos's novella, the fall of hi-fi soundscapes and the rise of lo-fi soundscapes, and the rise of new auditory commons in which sounds are not legible, but become ubiquitous, systemic, distributed. Thank you very much.